What? He's like, yeah, the TPP is. Sounds, sounds pretty good to me, eh? Like, I don't know what people are upset about. And I was like, what are we talking about? I just want a burger. Hey, welcome to episode 60 of Front Seat Gamer. I'm Nick. I'm here with Severn. Hey, Nick. And Blake. What's up? And today we've got special guest, returning guest, Jonathan. How's it going? Hi. Going very well, thank you. Good. We're excited to have you back. Uh, you've been hard at work working on the Path of Exile 3.0 Fall of Oriath update. In particular, you're working on some of the subsystems, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first of all, we're going to talk about what we've been playing Jonathan, let's start with you. Have you been playing anything? So I've been a little bit light on video games recently. Like the most recent game I finished was Zelda. Okay. Um, but I also played a bit of Horizon. And uh, I'm always playing Factorio because that's like the best game I've ever made. Oh, um, really? So, you know, oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and uh, other than that, like just a random mobile game called Polytopia. So that'll be uh, the, yes. uh, that, that, that's kind of my, my list of recent plays. All right. Let's talk but, about uh, Zelda very briefly. <laughs> I'm curious. Because I was, obviously I'm a huge fan. Yeah, yeah. I, I've talked about it for like entire you, episodes on. You've talked about that like just around me <laughs> yeah. more than any other topic yeah. I've heard you discuss. Yeah. I, think, I just so. love that game. So yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. Now, I, and you were, uh, I think at least initially a little lukewarm about it. Um, I would say I was always, I was, uh, I always really liked it. Okay. But um, it certainly grew on me a lot. Interesting. And um, I actually, um. So I've I've never played Zelda really. Like I think I played like I've played like the first couple of hours of multiple Zeldas even. Um, okay. But they always seem to baby you too much, and I got really turned off by that. Yeah. Um. This one is straight. You know, like you're just right into the doing whatever the hell you want right yeah, from the beginning. Their tutorial and, is climb a wall. Yeah. So I'm I'm a huge <laughs> I'm a huge fan of that style of like n of like not really a tutorial. Like uh -huh. you just discover stuff. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of how the game works um, like that. And also I'm really, I was really digging the kind of like weird sort of sci-fi, but not sci-fi theme they had going on. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. Actually, I sort of liked Horizon for that same reason. It, like, yeah, I'm actually a huge fan of like fantasy in a sci-fi world. Right. Um, the, the, that sort of thing going on. Um, we've had a lot of that recently. But yeah, can, we, we, we uh, have. But, between um, Zelda and Horizon. And there's like, I mean, even Fallout sort of qualifies. Yeah. In a, in, a, in a sense, I, I mean, know, there's all these really crazy one. mutants and monsters. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, but I don't know. That one's sure. feels different to me. But okay. um, the, the, the thing I find funny about Zelda is like it's like completely unacknowledged in yep. some way. It's like clearly these, you know, there's like you know spaceships and everything around here that you're exploring the remains of and that right. kind of stuff. A hyper yet, advanced civilization. Yeah, exactly. There's like <laughs> exactly that just vanished from the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you and just think, somehow, oh, these are religious shrines, yeah, not yeah, these yeah. giant nano machine yeah. structures or whatever so I'm, I'm i was i was a big fan of that but also just yeah the gameplay is real good um you know uh yeah just a just a solid real solid game i mean a plus know. uh sure yeah <laughs> would, absolutely um nick was telling me about the your experience with the korok seeds yeah 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 so i mean i didn't find um a, a, a korok seed for actually no i found like one korok seed yeah and um it was like because, like, I don't know how long I've been playing. For like, probably, like, 20 hours or something like that. And I found a single Korok seed. And it was just randomly, like, I was just, like, flying. And I just saw this, like, glowing thing. And then I landed on it. And it was, like, a Korok seed. But I had no idea this meant that there were hundreds of these places. <laughs> right. Everywhere. Like, I seriously just I had no clue. And so yeah. um, I'm like, oh, I, w I bet these inventory upgrades must be, like, super rare. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know how, you know, how you, how you get that. I remember because um, I was like, I, I asked you, how many Korok seeds have you got? Because yeah. I, I had about 100 or something like yeah. that. And you said one. I was like. Uh, oh, no, how many, how many have you found? Yeah, yeah. And one. No, the Koroxes. How yeah, many have yeah. you found? <laughs> so that, that actually, um, yeah, changed my perspective a little bit. You know, it's a little, it reminds me of The Witness um, mm. in a way. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I like not everyone mean. finds The Thing in The Witness. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'm glad it. you're being vague because yeah, yeah. we've talked about this before. I haven't yeah. played The Witness. I really should. Yeah, no, mm. you really should. You um, really should. But, but once... Once you realize they're there, you yeah. see it everywhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's exactly yeah. like the Korok seeds. It's exactly right. like that experience where some people just go through the witness and never even find the you know the, the thing. Right. Um, and you don't need to find it to play the game at all. Uh -huh. So it's kind of, you know, it's just interesting. Anyway, that, that so that reminded me a bit of that. So as soon as I sort of knew that they were there, I still get that many. I think, I've only, I, think I only probably got like um, maybe 30, 40 Korok seeds in the right. entire game. Like, because I was, I, I, it was so late that like I kind of didn't, um, sure. you know, didn't get a chance right. to, to see them. But yeah. 
Um, I also well, do do you find that you're uh, a very goal oriented player? Um, I so typically I like to collect the things that I see, but I don't go out of my way to find. Right, you don't things. go looking for. Them. I don't go looking for things, but if right. I see something, then I'll try and and do it. Yeah. So um, you know, uh, that's sort of true in any game. Like I'm not I'm not looking to hundred percent it. I'm looking to just like you know do all the things that I notice that are interesting. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. So but with the Corexes, once again, if I saw something out of place, I'd I'd go look for it. But I wasn't sure. like combing the land. Yeah. Uh, you know, looking for. Because I I found myself like I would find these. It'd be a, like a mountain range or something, and yeah. I would climb the mountain range, and I would just wander through all of the mountains. Yeah, I I, I definitely things. wasn't doing anything like that. I would yeah. just like you know if I was on, I'd be on my way to some place, and if I saw something, I'd do, I'd do something about it. But it was it was on that. Right. And then you know um towards the towards the end, I was kind of like you know what, I'm just gonna finish this thing now. I kind of need to you know to get going. I got the yeah. master sword though. That was you know. Yes. Do all that stuff. So, yeah. Um, it it was interesting. Then last last podcast. I don't know. Was this on the podcast that we talked about this? I don't think it was. I don't know. I don't what think are you it talking was. about. Oh no, no, it, it wasn't. You have to tell we me. Were, <laughs> we were getting burgers, and um, uh, we were talking about assets in games. Uh, I think you guys were talking about how there was a fortress in Horizon that had been hand modeled. Oh yeah, you you oh, were yeah. talking about that. Sven. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It, it was um, sculpted. Yeah, and. Then uh, we were talking about how usually games repeat use like they'll reuse assets and they'll they'll cobble together pieces to make right. new assets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I brought up, oh yeah, I, there's a, there was a thing in Zelda. I mean, I love the Zelda world, but it was weird. I'd sometimes find these like three trees next to each other that looked identical, mm. and that was always, that was a bit strange. And then Blake said, "Oh, those are Korok seeds." Yeah, and I was like, yeah, "What it's a Korok puzzle?" <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, it it was interesting to me that there was a whole subset of of puzzles i not even i had found yeah. and i i went looking for all these puzzles well e even when uh when i was when when i was playing it and uh there was a uh there was a what what turned out to be a core puzzle um there was like this we these weird things jumping from tree to tree mm -hmm. that you could only see in a certain spot and i couldn't understand what the hell they were and i thought at the time oh, i'll come back later um, and then Nick was around, so we said, all right, let's check this out. And then, yeah, it turned out to be a Korok puzzle yep. that I had no idea was even there. So they're just like, they're just all over the place. There's a bunch of archetypes that you, once you know what to look for, you find them. Mm. But then there's also like weird individual ones that are like interesting little special events as well. Mm. Um, and <clears throat> if that game is interesting because you, you train yourself on what to look for on these things. Right, right. Um, so you also play Factorio. Yes, well, Factorio, I reckon, is probably one of my top five games of all time, I would say. That's so, a real good game. Uh, I haven't played it. Uh, Ryan, who sits behind me at work, showed me Factorio. It looks yeah, so, like okay. a... So when when you see someone else's factory, it looks like a completely incomprehensible mess. And you look <laughs> yeah. at it and you're like, what yeah. the hell is this game? Mm. Like, that's impossible. But that game, more than any other game I've played, has this, like, building upon itself thing... Um, that's just unrivaled so like at any time you're like okay what's the next thing i need to automate you know like what's the next level of like crazy automation i right. can do and um you look back and like the funny thing is because you built every little piece of it by hand of your factory when you look back at it like you know what every little piece does and why it's all there right and but when someone else looks at it it's just like okay this is just what a is nightmare. this tangled like, what, mess you know what is this tangled mess of, 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 it's just, it looks like complete crap yeah um i know that game is excellent and actually um it's a lot like a game I wanted to make um, um, a long time ago, um, which I probably, I might have talked to, uh, I might have even mentioned this on the last um, podcast I was mm -hmm. on. So this was before Factorio came out, which is that um, I was, I, I really, so I really like that type of game. I'm like, a, I was a huge fan of like this, games like The Settlers and that kind of stuff. Right. Where you basically, you know, those economic simulation games. Sure. Um, and Factorio just really scratches that itch in a way that um, no other economic sim I think has. And um, it's just it's just really clever details like um, you know uh, I haven't seen another game that's uh, that's been able to automate like where you can automate literally everything like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's just really cool. I'm I'm a huge fan of that game. Uh, is that game doesn't seem goal oriented, right? That's um, just a you... it is, but you make your own goals. Uh, the thing is that they, they, there is some amount. So um, the core the core thing that kind of pushes you through the game is um, uh, getting technology. Okay. Um, so in order to research new techs, you have to get science packs and there's different levels of them. Okay. And each one gets progressively harder and harder to make. Mm. Um, so um, 
it's always like, okay, you know, in order to make the science pack, I need like, um, you know, advanced electronics. But in order to make advanced electronics, I need plastic. But in order to make plastic, I need to get oil. In order to get oil, I need to like send a train out to this like random place that's like far away. Right. And so the whole thing is very much like working, you know, like, so th then, then you, there's all these little sub goals that simply the, sure. the thing of like, you know, I just need to get this one thing turns into like this tree of like a million things I need to automate Yeah. because then you're like okay well in order to get, make this train system I need to get steel to make the train tracks but in order to get steel I need to like have way more iron than I've currently got and, you right. know, and like when run coal and everything so the whole thing's just you know it, it's kind of crazy you you so, find a goal way way yeah, down the, yeah. the production exactly. line and you have to work exactly so um, to figure out the 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 other thing is like you can kind of choose to what extent you want to automate stuff like you can kind of do stuff by hand to some extent like you know um or or you can automate it and um honestly you have a lot more fun uh, automating <laughs> so uh yeah so why is that if, if things are automated you're what are you interacting with at well that point? It, you're just you're just you're creating the next thing that you're automating like there's literally right. a never-ending list of shit you can automate in that game like it is never ending is so, there a, uh, is there an end goal uh, yes there is you have to launch a um a uh, spacecraft into space ah. Um, although in the recent version of the game, they actually made it so that there's science you can only get by doing that. So even after you do that, you haven't <laughs> oh, wow. it yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, what's the first technology that you start with? Uh, well, so basically you start with like, um, these like stone furnaces, it, you know, it's like <laughs> Minecraft in that way. Oh. Right. Like you start with a stone furnace and then you, um, manually put coal and iron ore into it right? and then make you know like make iron so you're not like you're not controlling like little guys right you're uh like well okay so like there's you're not i mean so you you have a, you have a character you've got a, your character you run around oh and okay. within within the within an area you can place um uh things right and um basically um like there aren't really like there aren't units that you directly control but there are like robots that do stuff hmm. um so, um, like later on, like, so this is, this is quite far into the game. You start to get, um, oh, so uh, yeah, so but I, sh I should mention the game is effectively tower defense, right? Like at the end of the okay. day, oh, at the end right. of the day, it is a tower okay. defense game, <laughs> right? But, um, what happens is, is that, um, so there's aliens that come from the outside of the map and, um, <laughs> like from, from the edge of the map and they come in yeah. and so you have to build turrets to right. defend your base Interesting. and, um, but basically you have to keep on expanding um because there's you know need more resources yeah and that's what leads you to more aliens but the other thing as well is that aliens are attracted by pollution so oh. the more pollution you have um the uh that the more aliens will come okay and um this is interesting because there's solar power in the game that's like really hard like you know you have to build like it takes huge amounts of space to build solar power yeah but it actually like by going to clean energy you actually like prevent aliens attacking you so much oh, so there's kind of this interesting like weird environmentalism mm. theme going on that like <laughs> it is. Sort of, it is weird that why would yeah. aliens be attracted to pollution? Well, no, it's not. It's not they're, they're not. They're not attracted like in a they like it way. They're like they attack you because you're polluting, right? Oh, like, no. but, like but, yeah, like, you know. But you're polluting your own planet, right? Well, it's not like like, like you're saying. So you you crash land on this planet. <laughs> oh, okay. So basically, so gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you crash land on this planet, and um, you know, the, you, you so you nah, start like, yeah. when you crashed, and then um, basically from that point onwards, you're trying to get back into space, which is why right. you have to build a spaceship. Cool. Um, so then, yeah, the, uh, this the, makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Me, and yeah. so then as you pollute while you're, you know, using your yeah. industry, um, then the aliens are, like attacking you cause you're like ruining their planet. <laughs> so <laughs> that's cool. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really cool. Are these aliens basically stone age at the start? Um, the aliens don't really get technology. They're just kind of okay. like, they're like alien ass aliens, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, alien ass aliens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, like, like they're just they're like, really they, they run really fast and like, and hit you with their claws and shit. Oh, right, they're right. zombies basically. Uh, well, I mean like fast zombies. What, what fast aliens. zombies hit you with claws? I'm thinking yeah. I am legend zombies. Those aren't zombies. Aren't they like spoiler? Aren't they basically just diseased people? Yeah. Right. What's the difference? <laughs> What's the well, one's a zombie how, and one's the, just a uh, sick dude. How, how's the nuclear tech in this game? Um, they actually added um, that recently. Um, so I haven't actually managed to build a, um, a like a nuke yet. Mm. Um, okay. But so so they added. Okay, so in this game, when they added um, like nuclear um, facilities, right? Yeah. So it's like okay, first of all, you have to mine the uranium two three. Um, Sorry, the random ore, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put it in a centrifuge. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, and of course, then you get two byproducts. There's uranium-235 and uranium-238. Right. Right? But you only get really small amounts. I can't remember which one is the good one, but there's, there's one of them is like the one you <laughs> two, need. 238 is the one you would need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, Sure, sure, sure. So anyway, so then you've got to worry about like, how am I filtering out the like, effectively the byproduct here of right. like, bad uranium that I don't that I don't want versus the one that, the, the one that you do. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so that's kind of like a whole complicated thing in itself. 
um you know and so then once you've done that then you need like you put the, put the uranium in a, in a uranium reactor yeah but then like that doesn't just generate power it generates heat mm -hmm. so then you need to use heat pipes to push the heat out to some to, 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 uh to um so, to steam turbines which um sorry to boilers which you know like boil the thing mm -hmm. right uh, the, the boil the boil water so you have to pump the water in Jeez. as well and then you've got to like pump the steam into some steam turbines that then you know um so these are huge Th these then, <laughs> so the whole thing like so the whole thing if to build a full like nuclear complex yeah. it's like this whole thing you have to design mm. and, and I mean, um, it's, then it's, it's like okay so afterwards then there's a you know radioactive um so you've got the, the radioactive byproducts you need to deal with yeah and there's like enrichment you can do you can like take those and then like try and enrich them using wow. some enrichment process okay to, like get more usable uranium 238 out of uh -huh. it and awesome. like there's all sorts of shit like it's just it gets real complicated um how do the aliens feel about uh, about nukes. uranium they're, they're actually all right like because you know does it, you, <laughs> yes, this thing, i right? respect this man. well yeah because exactly because nuclear power is very clean mm. so basically you want to switch to nuclear power this is why I asked. yeah exactly because the aliens won't attack you when, when you have clean energy that's great only um, if you have a good way of disposing of the of well, the waste product so they were originally going to have meltdowns as a possibility but i think oh, they yeah. didn't do it in the end because it like seemed a bit complicated mm. <laughs> but, yeah um, yeah you, you don't um, want to have to then create a giant concrete coffin yeah. for your nuclear reactor but, um, they do style. have um they, they do have you can you can use depleted uranium um for for weapons as well okay and, um so like you can all the different ammos you can build like you can get uranium versions of them uh -huh. and uh, i believe you can build nukes as well oh my god um <laughs> and uh the nukes just are like instant destruction to anything in a Jeez. large radius so this game actually does sounds pretty it's, it's it's really <laughs> awesome like I seriously i, I like it, yeah. it, it, it looks really primitive and like when you start it like feels kind of wonky but like it honestly like when you when you get into it holy shit that game is absorbing okay. like nothing else um so i highly recommend it um, um is it's that real good it, it, is it are there all those assets 2d uh yes they are they're 2d okay. but they've actually been high resing it recently um they've been right. doing like a pass um their company when they launched uh into early access was very small and mm. then they've been you know improving stuff right um so it's starting to look pretty pretty nice now cool um the, the last patch like it's got some nice animation stuff nice Good. so Vern, what have you been playing i, I wanted to ask jonathan oh. what, what are your thoughts on horizon have you gotten through i didn't play very much i only played through the starting chapter like i just got out of that starting area okay um so i i, I went on my honeymoon like right after i got to that that point mm -hmm. and then since i was away for like a couple of weeks i kind of haven't really had a chance to get gotcha back into it. okay but, uh, yeah so not many thoughts yet oh good um <clears throat> what have i been playing mm. uh george uh guy on the podcast a couple episodes ago oh, what, oh, brought, like a year ago <laughs> yeah brought uh tekken 7 in the oh, office right. yesterday yeah, yeah. and uh played, played a little of that yesterday are you any good at tekken you know uh there's a street fighter character in there yeah <laughs> and oh really so i went yeah akuma and oh, I, okay. I kicked everyone's ass really well i played two games beat <laughs> two people <laughs> and then retired and, at the top yeah, and then i just handed the controller over right. i love they, tekken weren't they making some kind of street fighter versus tekken thing at some point they, yeah they made it and they, they made it? tekken versus street fighter there was it was two different games yeah, i heard but I, I, maybe one of them was canceled or something or? yeah the tekken version of street fighter didn't didn't happen right okay. they, they released a screenshot of a ryu done in a tekken style mm. and then kind of just stopped the game never yeah. never showed up yeah well it's pretty expensive to do street fighter in that tekken style like the art is sort of right. Game. I suspect there was like well, I it probably wasn't even art that was the problem. Like Street Fighter controls are all sort of combo based and mm. and don't work very well in a three D space. Well, this this is what happened. Um, Ed, he was pretty good at Tekken, yeah. And he he went this character called Law, which is like a Bruce Lee kind of guy. So I went Akuma, mm. and I was just throwing fireballs at this guy, <laughs> and he can do anything. <laughs> yeah, that seems lame. It was great. <laughs> I just Street Fighter the guy. Okay. It's a good looking game, eh? Uh, yeah, in some parts. <laughs> I thought the, it looked the great. The thing is, Injustice 2 came out recently. Yeah. And so, like, you could compare the two. Okay. And Injustice looks far better than uh, Tekken, in, in my opinion. That game doesn't look fun, though. Injustice? Yeah. Why, why would you say that? <laughs> it just looks sort of like... It takes itself very seriously. Yep. And, it like, I don't... I don't care to have, like, an angsty Batman punching a robin you know like i don't I, who's that's not a, that if you care about the comics so you didn't like that batman, doesn't apply you didn't like batman versus superman then i didn't i didn't even bother to try oh, and watch it that Jesus, looked, man, that looked like it. a boar fest to me but um, I, I, it was yeah it was in, in terms of fighting <laughs> games uh like i'm a street fighter fan so all this tekken and injustice and mortal kombat just seem like subpar fighting games to me oh, right geez. okay yeah, that's, that's my opinion on it well you just nope. <laughs> visually, <laughs> you just invalidated your opinions. <laughs> visually, though, um, I, I guess injustice looks better. It's, okay. Yeah. 
just in terms of like. Models. I think I think the cool thing with Injustice is um, their story mode. Like Nether Realms has really kind of like perfected the whole telling a story in a fighter game. Yeah, the the bar's pretty low. In terms I mean, <laughs> with, with, with yeah, it is, like. but it's been low for like thirty years. Like it mm. took thirty years for someone to go, "Hey, what if we added an actual decent story in this instead of just like a wall of text?" Yeah. But how does that story get told? It's just through cutscenes, right? Yeah, through cutscenes that then seamlessly blend into a fight. Some well, of the well, fights, some of the fights, like what they do what seem are these contrived. Lives that like they always end up in a fight. Like yeah, no, they it start is... with an argument and then they're they're punching <laughs> superheroes, punching each other. Yeah, it like, is. It is. It is a little a like stupid game. like that. <laughs> what but, yeah, it is a fighting game. <laughs> sure, but that's that's my point. Like, why why do you need to put a story wrapper around that? Like. A well, fighting game can just be a series well, of fun you brawls. You could ask the same question about almost any game, right? Mm. Uh, yes, you could. You could. <laughs> so, However, I think that the it, it, a fighting game is much more contrived than you know, okay. like a shooter, for example. So you've got the uh, the John Carmack opinion on this, dude. I actually mentioned this in the last episode. You're talking about the porn. Yeah, thing? yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> uh, I don't agree with John Carmack. <laughs> okay. I I do think that uh, I so okay. Let me put it this way. Tekken's storyline has always been it's a fighting tournament and you your character wants to win, win for a specific fair reason. Enough, fair enough. And that's a perfect framework because <laughs> that all of those fights are now explained. But it's not particularly, <laughs> it's not particularly interesting, is it? Uh, I, I'm not playing a fighting game because I want like deep character well, development maybe you should be <laughs> yeah i mean like the story can just be the icing on the cake and once you have that you could be like man all these other games that are just a fight seem less interesting to I me mean, now look what you're saying is it's like asking so how come the result of like halo is that you always have to kill the aliens like, <laughs> like, like what is master chief's life like that he just has sure. to continue killing aliens is yeah, effectively what you're saying true. <laughs> however however then then they pull it off well Right, but okay. I, if if I, how does a fighting game say, okay, Batman and Wonder Woman, enemies now, punch each other, it's fine. Whole, I mean, that's and now whole... Batman and Robin. By the way, you're related. Punch each other, it's fine. That's related. The whole, <laughs> that's the whole uh, injustice thing. Is that I, from what I remember from Injustice One, I'm pretty sure it was like an alternate reality where they were like, the, we're literally every every other. There was the evil version a... of uh, <laughs> of of the, the Justice League, and that's how they they did that. Okay, well. <laughs> Good for them? I don't know. It doesn't appeal to me. All right. It's I don't fine. need it. It's I don't fine. need a I don't need a, a deep story for my, my game where I punch people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um Blake, have you been playing anything? Um not a heck of a lot. I've mostly been playing Stellaris with you guys at work. Yeah. So I want to talk about that briefly because we got a lot of questions that we that we should answer. Um but let's briefly talk about what happened last Friday. We played a 10-person game of Stellaris. I, you guys have talked about Stellaris on the, on the previous podcast. Maybe you really want to get it. Yep. Uh, and then a few other people at work, I think, also listened to it and then picked it up. Yeah, it sounded like it, yeah. Um, so if we all played a 10-person game for about... A 10-person uh, game, which is still going because yes. we've, pulled, we've, we've saved it and then we're going to continue next week. Yeah, every two weeks we're going to play like a, yep. a Friday night session. Yep. Now... Uh, that game is really fun, and there's some really cool story elements to it. Like the the world building and the universe building mm. in that is probably the highlight for me so far. <coughs> there we go. Um, nice. <laughs> like, <laughs> I try really hard. Uh, the uh, in multiplayer, you can't really pay attention to these these universe building elements, but. Yeah, those I wonder are, those if that's are so a, far my favorite part. Yeah, I wonder. I, I thought that might be a bummer for you because you said that you'd only played like a couple of hours before playing this multiplayer game. Yeah, and we're blasting through the multiplayer speed so fast that like events just pop up and you don't really have time. You can't actually like, yes, pause yes, to read yes, them. Yes, yeah, like, yeah. Yes. Um, however, what I really, really enjoyed about the multiplayer session was, and this is, I've I've played lands before, like I've done lands, and, um, and those are really fun, but. Never at a land have we all like taken a break and then talked about the state, the current state of the game, right? Yeah. And discussed strategy and discussed like what your plans are, and um, but then also trying not to give too much away. Stuff. Yeah. Did it, you did you ever play like Civilization Four or anything like that at land? Probably? No, I never played. Right. I never played a four X game right, at, okay. in multiplayer. Yeah. I says always. I I suspect that there's a similar yeah, thing yeah. at work there. Um, it seems like the main driving force here is the length of the game and the the slow unfolding of yeah, yeah. of mm -hmm. strategies and alliances. Um, that it was so much fun 
just uh, adding that social element to that game made uh, that experience much better than I was expecting it to be. The game itself is great. Yeah. But playing that game, and I suspect probably playing Civilization and other Forex games with a big group of people who are all in the same room, mm. super, super fun. Yeah. So. And you... um. You seem like you're doing pretty good because I, <laughs> I, I thought like, oh, you're, you're going to be stuck to like one or two right. planets and just get wasted. But then once I found you on the map, you mm. were like a pretty decent sized empire. Yeah, I expand, expanded very rapidly. However, uh, I expanded in a really silly way. Right. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, you could colonize a planet that wasn't in your territory. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I was just building frontier outposts oh, okay. and expanding my borders that way. Yeah. Uh, and using up and then, all your influence, right? And yeah. then and then colonizing planets within those borders, right? So I expanded really rapidly, and then I started to colonize within those borders. Yep. But that meant that I was uh, sort of drained on resources, right? I think it may have hurt me in the long term. Well, we'll but see. now I know better. We'll see. Now yeah. I know that you're in a weakened state. I'll I'll head over there. <laughs> you do know there's like four civilizations between you and me. Yeah. <laughs> giving away, giving away your uh, yeah. You make a poor diplomat, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, well, guys, we got no army. It's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you spent how much on your army? <laughs> Man, we don't even have a budget. <laughs> um, but you are from. You were in a federation, right? You you allied with a whole bunch of other I people. I'm allied with uh, Carl. Yeah. And he was quite tough, but I mean, he's quite far away. Yeah, me. and oh, cool. and Chris H. Yep, who was on the uh, last episode. Yeah, and um, uh, Michael, who who uh, handles some of the <clears throat> all the the alternate, like the ten cent style stuff. I think. Right. Anyway, <laughs> not important. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's important, <laughs> but what his job is was anyway. Um, but yeah, so we're in a, we're in a federation. And uh, that's that's helping me stay alive. Yep, because you guys you guys were in a huge war with these uh, uh, dragon guys. These yeah, who, who were an AI empire. Yeah, and they looked pretty scary when I first saw them. And then, yeah, they uh, they attacked Michael, and right. so then we retaliated. But we were I, I had never done any combat before, so uh, <laughs> didn't go well the first time. Cool. Um, it's interesting how. Uh, those alliances really change how people <laughs> talk to each other at work yep. in some situations. Yep. So it does. Yeah. It's very fun. Yeah. Um, I'm to play I, do, more of that. I do like uh, like talking about diplomacy and stuff. In uh, I do like playing with actual people in the same area because in the same room because you can actually like talk to them one on one instead of like yeah. if you're just playing solo, you've got very limited like diplomacy. You can only really send trade offers and stuff yeah. like that but with a human being you can make like way more intricate plans and and things like yeah. that which i really like yeah the uh chris h and michael had been planning out which planets they were going to take and like uh, yeah um sharing resources and all sorts of stuff so right. that was really cool um also chris h had made his own race in that game, which is a fantastic feature. Being uh, able to yeah, create your own yeah. race, the number of features you can control right. in that game when you're making your own uh -huh. race is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and his was the dog-looking alien mammal race. Yeah. And his faction was called the Good Boys, <laughs> which I just loved. So that, that to me, uh, is a sign of a good game, that you yeah. can do something like that and have yeah. it be, like, cohesive and entertaining. Yeah, and, it's cool. And... Um, Carl said he made a backstory for his. Yeah, he had a. We, we have a uh, Discord server and he posted a huge like backstory in there. I think uh, Josiah's done the same as well, who's also yeah. in there. I haven't. Um, I love that that game seems to combine role playing elements yeah. with, with the 4X. I do, I do sort of wish, because um, uh, a few years ago we played a, a game called Neptune's, Neptune's Pride. And it's, a, it's sort of like a simplified version of. Um, Stellaris, uh, but the way you you do your diplomacy is you actually send actual messages to players in the game, and I wish you could actually do that in Stellaris because you can't. There's no proper way to like send a diplomatic message that is a you know custom text that you've sent. Because mm. um, that if 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 you could do that, I I feel that there'd be a, a little more role playing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's true. Um, being able to like customize your diplomacy via a menu mm. as opposed to just having the buttons yeah be really interesting. yeah yeah 
or then having to like walk over to someone's desk and say, hey, how about we... Right. Well, that's part of what yeah. made the land so fun. Yeah, I mean, that is what made it fun. But Yeah. Yeah. It'd be cool to do it in-game as well. So I'm excited to, to start playing that again next week. Um, but let's move on to some questions, unless anyone else got games they want to talk about? No, let's let's roll into it, man. Yep. <clears throat> okay, let's start off. Uh, we, we actually don't remember. <laughs> We've asked you this before, but we ask basically every guest. Uh, do you prefer hot pizza, hot leftover pizza, or cold <laughs> leftover pizza? Uh, definitely hot, but but in the correct. oven. Correct. Not, no, not no. in the microwave. Cool. In the oven. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Co- correct. Yeah. See? Vindication. Oh, hey. no, in, the, in, the, in the oven is fine. Like in the oven is completely fine. Like I'll 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 try and reheat stuff, but as long as it's not like the microwave just does something to to food that it dries it look, out. So okay, so with, with the microwave, guys, <laughs> you, look, this is important. You need to not do it at max power. Right. I never cook anything in the microwave at max power anymore. Like generally, like like much longer. So if I'm like reheat, reheating any leftovers, like forty percent. Is good power for like way longer, oh. and then it's just significantly nicer. Like, okay, hundred uh, percent microwave does to chicken really bad stuff. Like, chicken mm. gets this horrible microwave flavor if you do it at hundred percent. Forty percent, it's sweet. It tastes exactly like the day before when you ate it. Before. So it's like so, a yeah. it's like a slow cook in the microwave. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't call it, it's not that slow, but the point is, the point <laughs> is seriously, microwave. seriously, like, like, would you just put everything in your oven at like three hundred degrees? Yes, because I mean, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> it, it could it gets heated up faster, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So I mean, basically, so basically, why would you put your microwave at always hundred percent, right? Yeah, so, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm a I'm a busy guy. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> I need those way, two seconds. To- <laughs> yeah. My understanding of how a microwave works is very different to how an oven works it, it energizes the water molecules well, right it, the the way it works is very different but ultimately you're still heating food from the outside like a lot of people say like, oh it's heating it from the inside out or whatever but it's not like they it's like they're imagining that the middle of the food gets warmer first or something, right. which is clearly not the case no yeah. like yeah because obviously ever... yeah yeah like obviously anyone who's eaten food from the microwave before knows that the middle is cold and the yeah. outside is warm well, and by like, the way when yeah. you get a bowl where the bowl gets really, really hot and the food stays icy yeah, cold. Yeah, that is really annoying. I hate that. That's really I, ha- I had to deal with that last night. Yeah. Like, what? Make a... Why is that? What's going on there? Um, I would assume that, like, it's just that the water, like... So if you if it's a very liquid meal, I would assume that the water on the outside is, like, you know, is, is, is like... So, like, the por- so the porcelain of the bowl yeah. is, like, a really um, good uh, conductor of heat. Yeah. And probably better so than the liquid is of the food. Right. So therefore, when it, when the water on the outside heats up, the heat is more likely to transfer into, into the, the bowl mm, rather than transfer mm, into the other into the liquid of the food. Could this be. is my this is my guess anyway. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, either that, or maybe it just it, it doesn't allow for the microwaves to pass through as cleanly or something. Um, I don't think it will be that somehow. Like, I'm pretty sure microwaves can pass through kind of like you know like ceramics pretty easily. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's a part of the. It's light spectrum, so it's, it's gonna. There's certain materials. Yeah, like, like I mean, for example, it can't pass through the outside of the microwave, right? <laughs> this is true. <laughs> well, if your microwave can cook itself, you have yeah. a problem. <laughs> Could you make a microwave that cooks itself? <laughs> you put a microwave inside of a microwave. It's like, mm. could God make a being so strong that? Um. All right. Uh, good. You you answer that question correctly. Okay. I think you're the first guest to answer that question completely correctly. Okay. Um, now let's let's go to the, the other very important question we ask all our guests: uh, space or dinosaurs? Well, okay. So what is space here? Like dinosaurs are in, are, are a living thing, and space yep. is not. So what are we? Like, the way we, we usually qualify this is: Would you rather see dinosaurs in person or visit or visit space in person? Hmm. Okay. Is is personal safety a factor here? Uh, that that is up to you. Like, <laughs> okay. let's assume for now that uh, space travel is as it is currently. So fairly <laughs> okay. fairly low safety. Yeah, okay. Uh, whereas, and, whereas meeting dinosaurs is completely safe. Well, <laughs> we've seen kids get get shaken around by gorillas. Uh, I think if, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you have a if you have a zoo full of dinosaurs, bad stuff's gonna happen. Okay, so you're saying Jurassic Park or yeah. space? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, I, well, I don't know if Jurassic Park is quite as as extreme as we're gonna go with that though. Okay, um, I reckon space. Honestly, yep, correct, space, correct, yeah. correct. Two all for right. two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, uh, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, no space, space. <laughs> all right, cool. Severin, how do you feel about that? I'm 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 okay with it, man. Okay. I don't believe you. What, what's this look like? Uh, don't, <laughs> like, don't, man. Our, our last guest, Ryan, he was on your side, though. Mm. 
He was he was he's very anti space. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he's so much pro dinosaur. I think he's just anti space. Yeah, okay. Yeah, his yeah. his we we talked about this when um actually this week we were talking about it and he he's his philosophy is basically we already know what's out there in space cuz we can see it with telescopes but we don't really know what a dinosaur looks like to which i say <laughs> that's not the point <laughs> we we kind of do know what a dinosaur looks like because alligators are a thing I, I <laughs> yeah, also, are they supposed to have feathers now not all um, of them apparently okay right like only the the t-rex like types the ones that eventually became birds yeah and also yeah so we know what birds look like yeah. we, we basically know what dinosaurs look like right it's just a huge yeah. bird with fewer feathers um i also posed uh ryan the question would you rather meet a dinosaur or meet an alien an alien that's at least as intelligent as a human being and he still picked dinosaur really yeah so someone's wrong with that boy yep. <laughs> <laughs> here's how i deconstructed that it's yeah, yeah. it's his imagination and he's just a pessimist <laughs> okay, mm. okay. Mm. Yeah. could be anyway it's good to attack him when he's not here to yeah. uh, defend yeah. himself yeah he will listen to this yep. <laughs> uh and ryan if you're listening to this right now tap me on the shoulder it's gonna be weird <laughs> um all right let's let's start with some of the questions that were sent in by our listeners uh this one came up from christoph who is uh very active on our facebook page by the way if you want to visit our facebook page Facebook.com slash front seat cast. Uh, so Christoph says Path of Exile has seen a lot of optimization over the years, such as the implementation of lockstep, multi threading improvements, uh, multi threading improvements, loading optimizations. Uh, what's next as far as optimization goes? What's the next area of focus? Network performance, graphics, CPU related, uh, compression, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any lockstep sized obstacles standing in your way? Um, I would say, honestly, that after 3.0, the game will be in a pretty good place tech-wise. Like, okay. we made a huge amount of improvements. Like, people haven't seen a lot of that stuff yet, right? Mm -hmm. So 3.0 is kind of like, um, I mean, obviously a big one there was like mini-map is like a, you know, a really obvious thing. Oh, yeah. But I kind of feel like there aren't really any big things left that suck anymore um, mm. after that point. Now, a lot of people will probably say, wait, what about trade? And yeah, mm -hmm. sure, there's that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of stuff that I care about, <laughs> <laughs> um, like the game will be right. but for me, From like a you know, pure it's, technical it's, yeah, yeah, standpoint, it, 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 I, I would say it's, it's very good. Like, um, it's it's way more polished. Um, yes. Three oh, like there's just like you know, like stuff like it seems dumb, but stuff like having that like gear intro video and stuff like that, just like it's just cool, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if anybody's really even cool. seen. That, uh, by no, the way. nobody will have seen that yet. It's, um, um, but yeah, there's like a like a, there's like a grinding gear logo that's like someone made. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. You know, um, if basically if you've if you've played Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Two and you remember like the <laughs> the, the never soft eyeball spear thing and and you're like dang okay. those like intro for developer <laughs> credit things that started games are cool mm -hmm. we have one now yeah we do so good and it covers and, and it's funny because like half the reason why is because like we're covering the load screen on Xbox oh. <laughs> <laughs> right so it gives you something to watch while you're uh, yeah do that but um. Yeah, the um, yeah, there's just there's things like that, you know. Obviously, the, the mini map I mentioned, and then just like, you know, just like the water the, effects look. The fantastic. water effects are really are really yeah. nice. I mean, that that was something that was really due for an update. Yep. And um, you know, yeah, I mean, things are just looking good. And uh, I mean, there's still got CPU CPU stuff to do, like optimization. Um, like I mean, I've said before to people that like I don't, we won't stop until you're ridiculously stupid builds actually work well right you know like you people have got their dumb like molnir build with like you know discharge and all that sort of three billion thing. spell yeah, effects exactly, going exactly, off a exactly, second exactly yeah. So yeah that stuff there we want to get so that's fast too um and we'll get there eventually yeah but um yeah i mean you know things thing, the xbox has has meant that you know like the xbox version has has effectively meant that we've come a long way on that sort of organization it's, right it's, it's, it's really good um yeah. sp speaking purely from the designer stand like as a from a game designer standpoint um I, I always see very small incremental improvements to these things. And yeah. in aggregate, they make such a big difference. Yeah, like, yeah. we talk about we improve ground effects. Eh, there's so much more left to do. And we talk about we, we've got these fancy new water effects. Well, that's cool, but what about all this other stuff? Yeah, yeah. But we and the thing is, we touch upon so many areas in uh, small ways so often that the the net difference is gigantic. Yeah, well, I mean, compared to like a year ago, it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. But the other thing as well is that like, I think that um, when we're sitting there um, being developers, like we see the client change so slowly, we don't yes. realize how different it is. Like, holy shit, I played 
online, like the, the deployed server recently. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, Jesus Christ, this game is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, seriously, like, you compare it to 301, and it's just like, wow, okay. Like, yeah. what were we even doing before? Like, because, you know, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and how so, old is that? Um, well, I mean, it, it's current. It, it, well, right. so, so, well, this is the thing, right? So, like, no, no, there's, there's several things going on. Like, part of it is that um, we. Like two six zero was based on two five zero, which was based on two four zero. Like mm. we haven't actually fully retagged, yeah, for like a really long time. So uh, like, retagging for listeners is yeah. is how we merge our. Uh, our yeah, so 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 retag is basically when we like say okay, like everything that anybody has done is now is now live, um, because normally when we're making patches, we just take specific people's changes and push and, and merge them in. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um and and then that's what you get. Um, so yeah, basically a. a a retag that we don't do it often because it requires retesting literally everything because anybody could have done anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, like people just commit random crap all the time that changes yep. stuff and uh, QA, you know, like in order to, when, when, when we, when we QA test a retag, it requires like literally testing absolutely every possible thing in the game. Yeah. Uh, which is a giant list. Um, um, and especially like we've removed difficulties and we actually removed yeah, the removing... difficulties internally, like, six months ago maybe oh, more so yeah my god the removing difficulties thing like like making 260 yeah where 260 has difficulties but the thing that people are making changes in does not have difficulties <sighs> was an absolute yep. nightmare like a lot of that work had to be done twice because you make it in um in trunk which is the name for the place where we make everything um and then we're like okay now we need to make a 260 patch for this and it's like wait okay hang on a second like everything's way different now yeah um, um especially because there are things that interact with difficulties oh yeah 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 That's uh true. The, the league stones and, and stuff we had to we couldn't test things like what yeah we, league stones are an ex- a perfect example of like okay we're making this thing that inherently has difficulties related to it because yeah. like you get more as you go up difficulties mm. but we're making it in a tag that literally has no difficulties yep so yeah i mean that's kind of thing it, it's annoying that's what this is like literally like people's entire jobs is literally just dealing with version control yeah so you know that's kind of crazy yeah that um Internally, the game has been completely different for months. And but yeah, months. for a very long time. So long. Uh, it's it's cool that we actually get to talk about this stuff. By the way, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're we're close to being able to launch it. We are, and also I have Relative the ability speaking. to randomly talk about things. That yes, yes. Don't We've announced really almost have. everything. I think basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I mean, also like you know, uh, obviously, um, normally when we have a GGG guest on this podcast they kind of know like <laughs> i need to be very careful yes um you know whereas i have since i've got more of an idea about what i can talk about it just yep. makes it easier so yeah also you get to make the decisions about what you can talk about um so. i mean i don't think chris would be happy if i talk <laughs> no. about certain things but you <laughs> that's know. true uh, which that's things true. in particular <laughs> yeah, yeah, can, you, well. can you list them and go into detail <laughs> well let's put it this way i'm not going to be talking about like you know what the act nine in bosses for example right uh, yeah you know. mm-hmm. i actually yeah. uh even internally when we're making things like uh achievements for Trio Bo, uh, we've I've at least I've been very careful about trying to avoid spoilers. Right. Within right. like, how do we say that what the achievement is without giving away what that element is? Yeah, and yeah. So it's inter- it's a, it's a, trying not to spoil things is an interesting problem in a game where you have the framework ahead of you laid out and visible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's also very hard because um, like so for example, when we're making a two six zero patch, we have to try and make sure that no three zero stuff is getting into that yep um so like i know that like you know people uh, people will make areas and then you know like uh chris will go through the game client and like t- change all the area names to be random stuff mm-hmm. that's not what they're actually called and yeah. make it so that the version that's deployed to online doesn't have uh any references to, to bad things yeah right. things still slip through but you know yeah like it's kind of funny. I, I remember uh when we were working on act four some stuff got like Put yeah, in yeah. Data mined and, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. They, the data the data mining tools are ridiculous these days. Like pretty much anything that goes in the client, people will know about immediately. Uh, yeah, which man. really sucks in some cases. Like I kind of wish yeah. people, you know, like spoil it for themselves. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, it, 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 it sort of sucks. Like, because I, I personally, I really like one of the things I really enjoy is watching people when we release new content, like slowly find it all and yeah. Yeah. post on Reddit and stuff like that. When you know. we released the uh, ten act trailer, yeah, uh, and and people were like. Oh, oh, act Act Five looks so cool. What else? Act Six, Act yeah, Seven. I know. Like those <laughs> those videos were so great. Yeah, like yeah. seeing the surprise, on, the the fact that we kept that under wraps for, for as long as yeah. we did as well. Was, that was a that was a really hard announcement to do as well because um, we weren't really sure how to structure a trailer to announce stuff like this. Yeah. So initially, we were planning on doing a trailer for every act. 
Um, but then we kind of like we didn't. But then we wanted to have so we had at least Act Five and Act Six talked about in the initial trailer because um, so you can sort of see like oh yeah, there's more stuff going. Right. Here. You know, we don't just think. But then like, how do you make a trailer for two acts? Like it just didn't kind of work. Yeah. And so you know, we actually had a act an Act Five trailer um, that we made and then scrapped. Yep. Um, which uh, you know, like yeah, that one. <laughs> that, that that one wasn't really w- w- was was turning out really badly which is why we scrapped it in the end but then we eventually uh, the one that we actually eventually went with for um announcing the you know the 10x track was actually really made really quickly compared to like all the time we spent i remember making the uh the, the act five one <laughs> i think and i remember when i said okay like i remember I, I sort of said to chris at some point like hey you know what like i don't think this trailer is ever going to be good <laughs> so like you know let's just i, th- I think we need i think we need to re-roll yeah like you know i think yeah. i think we need to just tell people like yep you know what all that work you did it's oh, being flushed down yeah, the garbage. Yeah. Because, <laughs> get, yeah. Forget about the sunk cost, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you have to. The sunk cost is the wor- is the worst. Like it's so yeah. easy to, um, you know, to 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 get fooled by that stuff. So, um, but yeah, I, I think uh, that trailer got made basically while we were on the press tour. Uh, it wasn't quite that bad. Okay, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was it was. Close. I remember it seeing drafts of it while. Yes, we were absolutely, on the press tour. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely close. Like we we had the sort of basic structure of it before that, but yeah. on the press tour, I was getting versions of it. Um, but then, you know, trailers have a funny way of just like always feeling like they're not good until the last minute. I'm um, like, no matter how early we start them. Yeah. Um, so I mean, you know, like um, yeah, it seems it seems like they take however much time it is until the trailer is due. Hmm. <laughs> this is what they always do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and also, um, a trailer is at least for a game like path of exile is literally just chunks of gameplay cobbled together with some narration and music. And we can't often at times look at the broad picture because we've seen those gameplay sections rearranged so many times. Mm. And, and well, I mean, they're also, um, they are getting more complicated over time, like more cinematic stuff. Yes. Um, that's true. You know, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's getting pretty complicated. I mean, those, those, those filming tools, are getting are getting pretty you know pretty hardcore like i mean getting all this like getting all the shots and they've got all these mm. um commands for like doing like uh you know all the camera style moves i always um, wonder how those get done yeah i mean so there's there's a cheat code like you know slash crane and then you do like a bunch of angles and then it like, right. does like a camera move and there's you know like pan and like all the different moves that you've heard from film school are mm. all in there as cheats that you just type and then um do it so you set them up and then i had do it. no idea yeah yeah that's uh that's, that's just that's pretty cool. cool i mean that's that's what that's what evan's doing all day is yeah uh, evan's Evan captures the most amazing footage. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Yeah. All right, let's ask... Uh, this is from Bradley. Um, at the beginning stage of game development, was there any point... Uh, was there at any point a disagreement between some of the designers that caused development to come to a pause for any sort of time? And if so, do you recall what the disagreement might have been about? Alternatively, uh, are there any large content or feature disputes that occurred that you can recall? So... I would say that for the most part, Chris and I and Eric uh, were on a very similar page when it came to design. Mm -hmm. Um, We tended to agree, but there is one thing that I would say um, that I think is a good technique for disagreements with designers, um, which is basically that if you, um, uh, if you, if you think it should be one way and another person thinks it should be a different way, take both options off the table Hmm. and say, Mm. we're going to, we both have to come up with a third way, right? Right. So basically, these two options are now just completely, you know, neither neither of them are good. Right. Um, and, and that's actually important because um, when two people disagree, it isn't usually the case that one person is wrong and the other person is right. It's more that both of you have concerns that should be addressed. And so therefore, there is going to be a better solution. Right. Now, occasionally what happens is that when you do that, in the course of coming up with a third thing, one person talks themselves into the other person's uh, argument, mm. in which case everything is sorted out again because now you just go with that since you both agree right. now. Um, but normally what does actually happen is that you end up with another um, another alternative that um, addresses both the concerns and both people end up liking it better in the end. Yeah. Uh, but the key is not, uh, the reason why you have to sort of have this moment of like, you know, no, we're ne- not doing either of these is because otherwise like ego can get in the way and then you start having, you know, like you're just arguing for the sake of it and the whole thing's just kind of not mm. very good. So um, that I would say is an important strategy, especially because both Chris and I are quite stubborn when it comes to arguing. So mm-hmm. it's very important that we uh, that, that we that we that, we, that you've we established that. a, a yeah, strategy for dealing ex- with those exactly. conflicts. Yeah, is that a strategy that's just evolved over time? Or uh, I mean, I would somewhere? say that we were caught on onto that one fairly fairly early. Um, did you but, you know? Had, did you learn that from somewhere? No, we just kind of it just kind of happened, okay. I guess. I mean, I'm sure that isn't. I'm not the person to come up with this. You know, like I'm sure people do it all the mm. time, but it's just it's just something that we that we do. Um, 
I'm having trouble thinking of specific disagreements that like, cause I mean, we haven't really had any really big ones. I know. I remember, I remember something that this is just a random thing, but I remember Chris was like extremely worried about the way that guild tags work. Like, you know how like you need to consume maps to make yeah. guild tags. Yeah. He thought that the player, the, the, the community would just riot, riot over that. Mm. And I was like, no, no, it'll be fine. You know? So, I mean, that's just like a random th- disagreement. <laughs> I remember, but um, yeah, in the end, like, one thing that you have to remember is that people don't know that they're supposed to be angry necessarily. <laughs> uh, so like if you give someone a system and they don't know that they're supposed to be angry, they probably just won't be, um, you know? That's so that's the, the clever, the, it's this funny thing. Like, and, and the, the other thing is like people, it, it's weird how the hate train can roll forwards or backwards randomly, depending on just completely arbitrary circumstances. Yep. Like all it takes is just like one guy saying, you know what, this is bad for this reason. And suddenly the whole community, like like you know landslides that direction yeah um versus if there's like positive stuff then suddenly they're going you know the happy direction so it, oh. it people i feel like sometimes people's opinions are just completely arbitrary like you know it's like it, it almost doesn't matter what the feature is sometimes yeah people just sort of get sucked into the zeitgeist yeah and, yeah and, and just... um so like you know there's certainly like if you see a hate train ro- starting to roll then you need to step in there as quick as you can and um, try to like ameliorate whatever the concern is. And then it gets them going in the right direction again. Right. So I know Chris is very keen, like anytime there's some kind of community drama to um, step in. He's fast, very active. Yeah. Step in fast and resolve whatever problem is perceived um, so that we can, you know, make like take people's, you know, just like we don't want one dumb thing to be the thing that ruins everything. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, and it's funny because like you know, you can launch a whole expansion and like there's all this awesome content, but like one tiny random nerf to some particular thing ends up being the entire narrative. Right. Or a six um, percent buff to yeah, one exactly, thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And like that stuff, like <laughs> it's like you know, it's like game is ruined because one little change. It's like okay, yeah. well, you know, that's not. <laughs> it's worth mentioning the huge amount of content we made, but hey, whatever. You know? Yeah. Um. It's interesting as well because <clears throat> whenever we put out patch notes. So we, we sometimes miss stuff just because of yeah, the yeah. huge number of things that get touched upon yeah. during development. Well, it, it annoys me that people think that that's somehow us doing something intentionally. It right. Never Our, is, we're, right. We're never maliciously yeah, yeah. hiding information. <laughs> right, right. It's just like we've changed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. Right. And uh, sometimes those changes are those are committed at the same time yep. and you and forget. People, people aren't always clear in their, um, in, in, in their, in their uh, commit notes yeah. exactly that something is important. Because like some random innocuous change could just be innocuous, or it could be like some massive game changing right. thing that matters to, to tons of people. Yeah. So like, um, Chris sort of says to people that like, you have to put the words "patch note" in all caps in the commit note if this is something that's important to mention. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. And also write the patch note. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that can be useful. I mean, you know, some people just like changed stuff, and it's like, okay, cool. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Eric is particularly. <laughs> it's just like environment. I'm like yep. what? <laughs> yeah <laughs> tweaks yeah tw- tweaks, tweaks is the worst tweaks one tweaks to what I don't, the, the worst one the one that i hate is people just do wip oh yep like all the oh, time right. all the time i hate yeah. that shit it's gotta be an artist thing yeah, yeah. WIP is it is it is often yeah. the artist yeah, yeah. Sam has, they're, they're, i mean yep. to be fair your things are like four weeks of working on the one thing and jonathan yeah. i'll tell you what happened was we we expanded too fast yeah we can't like it, it's a thing where I have to t- tell like yeah, 20 yeah, people yeah, now. No, I know. Yeah. No, no, the expansion expansion yeah. is rough. I mean, it's it's funny because like you hear about companies that like hire a hundred developers in like a year, and yeah. I'm just like, I, I mean, we have had enough trouble ingesting like twenty people in a year. Yeah, get them to a hundred a year. I just don't even understand like how you could possibly like you know teach people stuff. You know. Yeah. Think about like a company like Google who goes from like three people in a garage to. 400,000 people across the world well, in 20 I remember years. Hearing it's about, like, I remember hearing about Amazon where like, I think, you know, I, I'm just going to screw this up because I don't remember the numbers, but I read some article about like the number of people they hire in a year and it was like, they have to hire like, like 300 people a day or something like that. Jesus. But then when you, so and then when you factor in like the, you know, like the number of people leaving and stuff and you know, like it's just, it's just absolutely the crazy. Turnover, and it's like, yeah. how do you even, how, how do you even manage that even vaguely? There's like, whole I just don't, departments yeah. that yeah, just manage exactly, that. You know, like, that's it's like crazy. And, and hiring kind of sucks, honestly, like to do. Mm. So like, you know, <laughs> you, you're having to take well, time out of your freaking regular. Yeah. Yeah. I work. mean, it, it's also like, and the, and the more people you hire at once, the worse it is. Mm. And you know, just getting people. Yeah. Like, I mean, New hires take a lot of attention um, to, 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 you know, to get them up to speed. Yes. And like, you know, there's a lot of babysitting to do initially. Mm. I mean, this so, is this is why middle managers. Yeah, I guess. But the, other, up, the right? other thing as well is that every hire is like a roll of the dice of like, do you even like this person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's you, like. You have, what, an hour to develop on the opinion of, do I want to work with this person right, eight exactly. hours a day, five days a week? It's, exactly. 
And you're not even talking to the guy. You're, you're talking of like a, he's pretending to, he's trying behave to be a certain way. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's <laughs> yeah. trying to impress you. Yeah. Like yeah, he's, yeah. he's gonna be like exaggerating his skills. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 real tough. I it's, it's not my favorite thing to do. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you have to do it, I guess. And it's funny because like sometimes it seems that like the company just grows despite what I want. Like <laughs> honestly, <laughs> like it's like I honestly like it'd be like, oh yeah, I don't want to hire anyone else. That's it. And then there's like ten more people walking the door. He's yeah. like, Jesus Christ, where these where these people come from? Like, I thought we were hiring people anymore. <laughs> yeah, but no, it just seems to grow like a like a virus. <laughs> Even uh, in the last few weeks, I've been seeing like new new potential hires walking through. Um, we get we I mean we're interviewing people all the time. Like, yeah. So the thing we really need um right now is a um uh like we need. <sighs> Like we really need some more server admins right now. Um, mm. Like uh, we've only got two, and it's yeah. really not enough. Yeah, they're um, they're on call as well, right? Yeah, and they're on call, so really we should have at least like four people, to be honest, to do a proper on call rotation. Yeah. Um. But uh, you know, and like, yeah, it, it's um, it, it, it's it's real tough to find good people though. So mm. um, the other thing as well is like it's worse when you're hiring for a role that is not a game development role, because when you hire game developers, like there's a kind of common, like. Everyone who who wants to work at a game development company is into games, generally speaking, right? If you hire yeah. a 3D artist or a game programmer or a game designer, like, you know, they're all, they're, at least there's that to kind of, like, bind you together. Yeah. When you're trying to hire for a server admin, you get all kinds of random people from all over the place. And, um, you know, like, a lot of people just worked in for random big corporate companies that are soulless. And, right. You know, mm. like, and so, you know, like it's, it's kind of like there's just a very different culture there. Yeah. Um, they were the sysadmin at a hospital or something. Yeah, like that, ex- you know? exactly. So um, that means there's, so there, there, there's more of a culture clash there that you have to yeah. deal with. Like a lot of people from large companies like that are, ver- um, are not used to the way I think we are, where we kind of more like people kind of might be expected to do kind of whatever and he's doing mm. um you know like as, as you know a server admin at a big company might be like okay i do this exact one thing this is what i do i manage this thing and i'm not interested in doing anything else yeah whereas our server admins are like okay some random artist might need you know like this you know some random tech support thing and then mm. but then on the other hand you have to like maintain our, our, our you know our server infrastructure or like some guy like might be getting a new hire and we need a new computer built or like maybe the printer stop working whatever someone needs right. to deal with that stuff you know what i mean it's interesting um, that our sys so, admins are basically the entire RT, IT department, right, exactly. as well as sysadmins. Right, right. So they kind of need to do a bit of everything. And so um, I think, you know, like some people aren't used to the concept of like, you might be expected to do any arbitrary task that needs doing, you know? Yes. So that's a... Um, that's but I, thing. speaking personally, I love uh, the fact that we have some far reaching tasks. Right, right. Just um, kind of because it keeps things stuff. interesting. It does keep things and interesting. You, and you learn new things. Yeah, yeah. Learn new skills is pretty important. Yeah. Um, so this is a question from Stephen Knightley, who oh, yeah? uh, runs the what the well, or at least he used to run the the game dev meetups. Yes, exactly. Here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there like a an organization that's that's yes, called the New Zealand Game Developers Association? Um, he yeah. was the um, he, he was the is it the president? Is that what you call the, him? The chair, the chairman. Yeah. Um, I think that um, he was an actual chair. Yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. He, he's like a, he's like a spokesperson, right? Yeah, yeah. He, um, he yeah. appears Spoke on chair. media that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is a question in a complex game like path of exile. How do you set up a beta? So you learn something from it. Do you have spe- specific questions you want to test or do you just look at everything? Um, so generally speaking, we're not a hugely analytics focused company. Um, but we certainly do do some of it, right? Like, yeah. so we're certainly looking at like what, what skills are being used the most, what kind of stuff like that. Um, generally speaking, um, the, opinions i think you get from like a kind of just a chat to someone are much more interesting than what people will choose to post on a forum Mm -hmm. and the forum reports are important because like you know there's tons of random like oh yeah this you know this thing's bugged or this thing's whatever like that's obviously just the bugs you get very well from the forums Mm. but i think for stuff like balance feedback um individual reports on forums aren't so aren't so great right um and you're much better off either looking at what they do which is like you know um like either analytics or literally just like watching someone play yeah um, or just having a conversation, I think works a bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you know, people, when they're complaining on forums tend to be just complaining, right? So you only hear about the negatives and stuff like yes. that. Yes. It's actually really sucked about, um, so we're, we, we've got an alpha running at the moment for three hour. Yeah. And, um, the people who like hang out in chat in alpha are getting a much better perception of what the reaction is like and what we need to be doing 
than the people who just look at forums. Yeah. Um, you know, like in chat, you can see like people were saying, you know, like, because I mean, part of it is just you actually get some positivity as well as negativity, right? <laughs> and you also, <laughs> and you also get the, the gut reaction. Yeah, when exactly. Exactly. New, and then, you know, rather than them stewing on it overnight. Yeah. Like, if I was to just look at the forums for the 300, I would be like, oh, well, this very this, worrisome. This expansion is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you sit and chat and everyone's like, oh my God, this is so cool, then you're like, okay, yeah, this is, this is good. This yeah. is good content. You know? um, uh, it's interesting. I, I know, uh, Mark too has very particular opinions about feedback. He he prefers people to leave very short, very uh, direct feedback. Right. Uh, but oftentimes we get uh, people who post huge, long, like fourteen right. paragraphs, and they try and touch upon everything. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that ends up being less useful because sometimes the feedback gets confused, right, and right. sometimes uh, it's not specific enough. Uh, and sometimes it's too specific that yeah. it, it, they try and offer solutions. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what you definitely don't want. People yeah. who offer solutions, um, like you, it just means you have to reverse engineer and find out what their problem was. Yes. So uh, uh, you know. the the Magic the Gathering uh, lead designer says your audience is great at telling you what the problems are and terrible at answering those Absolutely. problems. Absolutely. Basically. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I, could, yeah. Could I step in? Um, how much designing do you do? Um, I don't do the grunt work design anymore, mm. um, but I'm generally talking to people on a higher level. Um, so, uh, like, you know, like the real design work people like Nick and so on are doing. Mm. Um, I think that one thing that's important that um, Chris and I still do a lot is basically checking everything for um, for st the style of POE. Mm. Mm. so um like people designers will come to us and they'll be like okay here's my idea and um it really is still only chris and eric and i that have a good sense of like does this fit the game's style mm. it's a very hard thing to teach mm. um so i um, mean maybe that's a bit nebulous because like maybe this is maybe we're just actually this is a proxy of just like what we like yeah but i think there is something to be said for like you know have the game being internally consistent with regard to what kind of things go in it yeah so. you guys are sort of the gatekeeper of is this the sort of content that we want people to find a path of right 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 so i mean sometimes um i think it can be very disheartening especially when you're not used to being rejected continuously right um because like it really is the case that we say no to like nine out of ten things mm. yeah um that's, that's true yeah <laughs> <laughs> i can i can speak from experience right right, right. you, you um, toss a lot of ideas out but people need to realize that um you know like th it has to not just be you know things have to not just be like okay they have to actually be really good yes and one way that um uh th there was like a, a blog writer that i remember um reading a while back i can't remember which one it was but he basically said look you have to sort of imagine everything starts with like negative 100 points and you have to at least get to zero before you can even be considered to be a thing that we could do. <laughs> and is that how you view everything? That's, kind of how <laughs> That's view the everything. Jonathan filter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like everything starts like worse than bad. Right. <laughs> and you have to, you have to oh, kind of yeah. work your way up to be okay. Yeah. yeah. And then we can start looking into things, you know. You, so. start, you sort of imagine the worst case scenario of that feature. <laughs> yeah. And well, you that, say, is, that is important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like it's kind of, you know, it, 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 it's tough. I, I, know, I know some people... Um, like you know, there there have been there have been artists in the past, I think, who um, uh, who find that a bit rough sometimes with feedback like that. I but then I think people also come to appreciate um, getting honest feedback about things as well. Yes. Like I know Russell. I mean, he doesn't work for us anymore, but um, he would he always used to say, you know, I really like coming to talk to you because you actually give your real opinion about mm. things. Mm. Um, so I think that that is important. And um, sometimes I worry that there's a bit of a good cop bad cop thing going on <laughs> with me and Chris. I'm the bad cop. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I definitely don't hold back when it comes to, you know, to, to talking feedback. about it, to yeah. feedback about people's ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is uh, healthy ultimately for the company and the game. Um, yeah, it can be. But once but again, it can uh, be soul crushing. It can be a bit soul crushing. <laughs> I understand. I, 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 honestly, I, I don't, it's not like I'm trying to be no. this way. I just think this is me naturally. I just kind of, you know, Right, you're, you're, but, you're, but it's also it's something you point. care about. Yeah, it is definitely something I care about. Um, you know, so. I, I've heard from a lot of people. They say, you know, we make the things that we'd want to play. Does right. Path of Exile stay true to that? Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, right? We were really keen to make it an awesome action RPG, and there's mm. just a certain, you know, there's a certain style that comes along with that. Yeah. Like I remember, um, <laughs> it, 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 it's funny the little th the little details that matter. Like, um, 
a random example of that is there was this thing where um so we've got like normal items magic items rare items unique items and each yep. of them has a place and there's this very specific like you know uh like i remember when a designer came in once and they were just like oh yeah well we should add like you know legendary items whatever like a tear above rare mm, yeah Let's and I'll creep this thing. Yeah, exactly. It was just sort of seems like, and it just sort of seems yeah. like, oh yeah, well, I mean, naturally, if you've got these three tiers, why not add a fourth tier, right? You know, it sort of seems like World of Warcraft. Yeah, well, exactly, like, right, yeah. exactly. And it just sort of seems like, yeah. But the thing is, they don't realize that there's a lot of subtlety going on there with like each of these things already like has a specific purpose, and, right? You know, it isn't just you know you can't just play more. a role at a specific point yeah, or yeah. play a role. At a specific yep. point. And you've right. got to mow down the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, like there's stuff like that that um, that's subtle, and you know, yeah, as I said, there's just a lot of subtleties that are, that are hard to pick up on. Mm. Uh, this is a question from Remib. Oh no, let's let's go with the question from Palm Fraud first. Sorry. Um, this uh, in a previous Q and A, uh, you mentioned the Skinner box systems as being one of a small handful of elements integral to ARPGs. It was in a rapid fire segment with other devs, but I think it's worth unpacking that claim a little bit more, specifically in regards to how other games in the free to play slash mobile sector leverage that sort of behavioral psychology. So, uh, Skinner box for people who don't know is a basically a lab experiment where you've got like a rat or a guinea pig uh that has a button that they can press for a reward and sometimes that reward is random and sometimes it's not and you look at how they behave as a result is that correct yes yeah so uh notably in in path of exile i guess uh item drops yeah. and and whether item rarities and the mod tiers these yeah. are all Absolutely. Parts of the Skinner box. So, I mean, the, but, I mean, just to, to, to be clear, what the Skinner box thing shows is that people like, um, people are more addicted to random rewards than they are fixed rewards. Mm -hmm. And um, a really great example of, I mean, with, with items in particular, it's very important that you have this feeling of like, at any time, an awesome item could drop, right? And that's really important. Um, in World of Warcraft for a while, they changed to having this token system where when you went on a raid, um, you get tokens, then when you go on a certain number of them, you get enough tokens and you trade in mm. for the thing that you want. Yeah. And what that means is, is that like, you look ahead of you and be like, I have to do this raid 200 times mm. and then I get my thing. Um, whereas um, before they introduced that system, um, at any raid could be the one where you randomly get your thing. Yeah. And that actually may give you more of a reason to play the next raid because you're like, this could be the one, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas when it's like 200 in, in the future, then you're like, okay, well now I have to make a decision. Like, do I want to spend X many hours of my life mm -hmm. to get this thing? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why I think why there's a sort of a fundamental difference there is that, you know, just the feeling of at any time I could get something um, is, is really important. It's interesting in particular, uh, World of Warcraft in at Vanilla used to also have a lot of uh, world epics. Right, right, exactly. Um, and uh, some of the best items in the game prior to like Blackwing Lair tier raids were just world epics that could drop anywhere. Right, right, right. And when you found one, it was a huge deal. Uh, then they sort of removed a lot of those and then they started making even rares account uh, and uh, or soul bound. Um, and that to me completely hindered the joy of leveling because at best you're going to find some green items to disenchant. Yeah. And yeah. and then quest rewards are metered out and mm -hmm. you get to raids and you do your your raid gear and that's that became very dull for me. Absolutely. Um, so so yeah, I mean that 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 cycle of just, you know, at any time I could find something it, that makes the it makes you want to keep playing. So, um, uh in terms of psychology, are are there any other aspects to Path of Exile at play that you guys very carefully looked at or or implemented or or are there things that you, you avoided um honestly like not a not a huge amount i mean that, that that is really the main one like in terms of player psychology we there there is another one that we've often um talked about which is the um in terms of player psychology which is the sort of magic the gathering style um player archetype thing mm -hmm. um so that's the idea of um that there's three main um player archetypes timmy johnny and spike um where um, Timmy is all about, I just want a big flashy thing that looks cool. Yep. Um, Johnny is uh, the idea that I want to um, like do something clever. Mm -hmm. So come up with an interesting combo. That's kind of like the whole thing about like, you know, coming up with interesting builds. That's like the whole build of the week style thing we have in, yeah. in POE. Um, and then there's Spike, which is just the power gamer. Yeah. Um, so it's basically saying that um, everything you add to a game should appeal to one of those three archetypes. Mm hmm. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at creating uniques and stuff like that, that's what we're thinking about. Um, so, you know, that, that's a kind of another another big one. Um, 
but um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that, like in terms of design philosophies, those are, those are really sort of two. You know, there's there's the player archetypes, and then there's the kind of Skinner box style st- stuff. Right. Um, those those are probably very important to the soul of our game, and those two, you know, two two very important. Um, things. on top of that, I I feel like, uh, the idea that your items are real and permanent. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, that's just you know, like that that, that I, I honestly don't understand how anyone would make an online game without you know thinking about that right like that's just a huge sure. it's just a huge a huge part of it like it really baffled me i mean hey it works for hearthstone somehow but i find the concept of like you know you can't trade your yes. your, your cards in a trading card mm. game it's very strange um, to be <laughs> to, to be a bit ridiculous mm. um because like to me the the fact that they um the ability to trade something makes it have value even if you never trade it yes like the fact you know you could trade it is the thing that makes it, it have some value Mm -hmm. you know like without that there really just isn't that same feeling of like you know i have a real thing that you know you know that 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 i that i own and it's mine and i really you know and i value it right uh card collectors have cards worth a lot of money potentially uh and they will brag about that even though that money will all almost certainly never be realized you know it's actually funny like you see people um like they'll feel really good about buying like you know ten five dollar cards and then it goes up in value to ten dollars yeah. And it's like, okay, I've well, just doubled my investment. Yeah, you made, Are you going to sell it? Nope. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like, okay, well, you made fifty bucks there, but you're never going to sell it, and you're probably like, t- in order to sell those cards, would probably take more than fifty dollars of effort. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> you know. So, like, what have you really gained? But they feel really good about it. So, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip the remib question. It's a it's pretty sort of balance. Uh, right, Jonathan. Out of the three archetypes, you must be a a, a Johnny, right? You reckon? Yeah. You reckon? Uh, well, I, I'm going to say, I think you, Chris, and Eric are Johnny. You reckon? <laughs> uh, Eric Eric is a power gamer. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Eric Eric only cares about, like, you know, how how, how good is this? Like, like All right. he, in, in Magic, like, he's just like, you know, so, like, and in, in, in when he's playing Magic, he's just like, I want whatever the top 10 net deck is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, whatever people is, whatever people oh, are saying man, is online is strong. Yeah. yeah, I'll just take the best one, right? That's just me. Like, he's, he's, not awesome. in, he's not interested at all in playing yeah. anything but the okay. best. Okay. So that's that's what Eric that's what Eric is. Uh, I feel like Eric and you also have a, a spike element. Um, I don't know that I would. I actually would say that I don't. I, I uh, no, sorry, I, I don't know why did I say spike. I meant Timmy. You reckon? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Eric to some extent. I mean, there's there's a matter of things being cool. Let it right. That does matter. Yeah, that does matter. Yeah. Um, well, that's often like when you come when you tell me about things that you've enjoyed in Path of Exile. It's usually the thing, and you say, oh, oh man, the coolest thing. Yeah. Um. Like the certain boss fights or, yeah, or yeah, certain yeah. skills or certain items, um, yeah. and and the ones that you you bring up are are the ones that are quote unquote cool, yeah, um, and usually quite splashy, yeah. Um, and Eric, of course, being the the creative director, is very focused on having cool moments in the game, yeah, yeah. Um, so both of, I think the Timmy element um, is also so important as our game becomes more commonly streamed, right, for uh, audience growth. They need to be able to see cool stuff, yeah. Uh, Johnny stuff is very opaque to new right, players, right, right. and Spike stuff is also very like it doesn't. If you don't play the game, it doesn't matter. You don't care about Spike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Timmy is so important for for new player acquisition. Unfortunately, um, the the Spike players kind of tend to drive balance and so yes. on. Yes, because um, ultimately the ones most demanding of that kind of stuff, and it can be a bit of a shame sometimes when you have to give up on a thing that's like really interesting or cool, just because like you know that once it gets power gamed. Mm. Um, you know, the, the ultimate end game of that is is is, is bad. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of a shame how that works, but uh, you know, there's like a um a word. Uh, there's, a, there's a term called grognard capture. I don't know <laughs> if you've ever heard of grognard capture Never. before. Please okay. tell me. So grognard capture is basically the concept that over time anything will um t- tend towards pleasing the most like nerdy and hardcore people in your audience. <laughs> mm, um, because they're the ones who are the most active like complaining about stuff mm. and so therefore you end up like uh you know basically doing everything for those people yeah um and so you know basically everything just devolves into something that's really complicated and hard to understand mm. because like you know the, you're, you're solving the issues for these people right um so yeah grognard capture is something you have to fight against hmm. um <laughs> huh where did that term originate um i don't I used to know the answer to that, but I honestly can't remember now. I think right. it's like some type of monster from some role-playing game or something like that. <laughs> it's gotta that. be. Um, <laughs> a grognard, that's yeah. what it sounds yeah. like. But um, I honestly don't really remember. Oh, maybe it was... Up. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. All right, this is a question from Red Peanut 4 um, All right. I, I, I would love to meet 
the first three red peanuts. Uh, have you had any regrets regarding not implementing something into Path of Exile? And if so, what? Um, that's a really good question. Are there any features that you that got left on the cutting room floor that you you really regret? Um, I'm trying or to think. Potentially, are there any things that uh, we have now prov like no chance of ever implementing because of currently existing systems? Um, well, I mean, I've got I've got one thing. Yeah, yeah. You you know how you wanted it to be two point five D at one point. That was the thing we discussed. It was it was it was. I, well, I how do you feel on cool. it? Looking looking back on it, we I mean, committed to full three D. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it, it, it obviously three D was you know better better in the end. But mm. I mean, sometimes I look at the mini map. Mm. within the new style and I'm just like man it would be pretty cool to make a 2D game <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Okay. you should have oh man we should have a button where you swap the mini map and the gameplay screen <laughs> yeah. locations oh my god yeah just play on the mini map I mean yeah. some people do basically right people yeah. practically do sometimes yeah but, uh, that's true yeah no I mean you know I, I, I don't I wouldn't say I regret that mm. um you know I'm trying to think like honestly there's probably isn't a huge amount I mean so probably probably the thing that's like the most like the biggest problem in my opinion in the game and Chris Chris really feels strongly about this one is that um it the tension between like equipping items and dealing with sockets is like super like it's probably more annoying than we were hoping yeah um you know like it sort of sucks when you can't like change your character due to the socket problem right you have um, a great body armor with stats yeah and you but I honestly don't think we can colors. solve that easily now um you know like there's too much I mean, maybe we could, but I, there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot sort of tied to that, tied to that, now. and then like you know, and, and so so it would be really difficult to deal with. I mean, so we, we we have an alternate idea of how we would do it if we could restart it today, um, but I honestly don't think we could change to that. Or if we did, it would have to be in such a large, like put it. it I mean, it would be a four oh oh level of change mm, if we were to yeah. do something like that. Yeah, you know? like it would it would have to be like a serious a serious change. Um, so, you know, I mean, in 3.0, we had enough to be getting along with. Right. Um, you know, I mean, also changing something like that, um, every existing player yeah. has to relearn, relearn a system. Well, you basically. know, I mean, this is real rough, um, even in 3.0, just with removing the difficulties. Like, if, yes. you, if you're if you a player who played halfway through Crawl, what is your experience like? Yeah, where do you start? Uh, where do you start, right? <laughs> um, and so it's kind of like, well, you probably have, I mean, you have to start at the, at the, the at, I mean, well, yeah, this is it's tough, right? I mean, you're probably starting at the beginning of Act Five, um, but then well, you're going to be way over level. You're going to be way over leveled, yeah. and so then it's kind of a weird experience there and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, like that kind of sucks. I mean, thankfully, the beta um, kind of makes that for at least our, most of our players makes it a bit better because there's a chance to start over again. So you're going to play it from a normal level. Yeah. Um. So for all those people, that and, and um, also the league system, mm. of course, means that generally speaking, when people come back, they play in leagues. But yeah, I mean, we've actually got a bit of a problem. In fact, all free-to-play games have this problem, actually, where when you come back after a while, um, everything's different in a way. Like, So, I mean, I've, I've heard people on other podcasts actually complain about, you know, you come back to, like, some game after a year, and then, like, your character is all screwed up because, like, they've changed the systems mm, half a dozen yeah. times. And so I don't know how to, like, play anymore. And you sort of start to go, and you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and then you leave again. So I think the league system in POE really helps with that because we are encouraged to start from, start from the beginning again. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it can be real tough. Like, you know, like, we have to be able to change stuff um you know that's really important but then that means you know like refunding people's passive trees and shit like that yeah um which kind of screws you know screws people up like generally speaking if someone comes back and their passive tree is is, re is um is uh been removed um when they respec again after that the character that they make because they're just doing it from scratch is like really bad compared yeah. to the one they had before mm, yeah um because there's this thing like as you're leveling up you're like you know you're, you're like putting points into life if you're dying a lot and you're putting points to damage if you can't kill anything and so like there's kind of this thing where like you're always fixing the pro your own problems whereas when you allocate all at once it's just like you just make some you know some some, some best guesses yeah, some yeah, best guesses you don't really do well and on top of that you yeah. all of your gear is disabled so you go for the attributes just to make your gear work and yeah you know results in yeah. non-optimized path yeah i know and the whole thing's kind of kind of bad so it's it, yeah. it sucks that like um the, the, the sort of returning player experience is not as good as it could be, but I do think the leaks help. Um, yes, a lot with it. it helps yeah. a lot. However, uh, the psychology of restarting is good is a very hard one to to convince new players. It really of. is. It really is. And um, I think that uh, we managed to do it in our community. Um, our, but, our our regularly playing community. Yeah, yes, but, it, but for well, sure. To be honest, okay. Well, I mean, to be honest, I think even when when new players start. Because they're in that community, they, mm -hmm. they, inst they get some of that instilled uh, into it. But actually going to new markets sometimes can be a challenge. Like um, when we went to Asia, 
um, a lot of um, those communities did not have that concept mm. instilled in them. And so now what we found on our, on our realm, most people play in leagues, but on their realms, um, people were playing just in standard all the time. Interesting. And it was really hard to convince people to create new characters for the new leagues because they just hadn't had that instilled into them. Well, I wonder if part of that is uh, MMOs in those regions have like are extremely grindy. You, um, you commit to a character for a very long time. That could be part of it. Um, I also think part of it is just that, um, like, there's a sort of nebulous like feeling that comes down from the developer in the English territories because mm. like we communicate directly with our people, so it means you kind of get the like our values are sort of instilled in the player base. Um, when you're dealing with an overseas region where we don't speak the language, there's no chance for that to happen, and the publisher doesn't necessarily instill that in them either. So I think that that sort of subtly changes things. So um, I know this is something that um, we've talked a lot about with Tencent for China, is we want to make sure that Tencent is kind of instilling the value of restarting mm. um, into their community, because it's actually really important for the long-term health of the game. Um, because if you just play only in standard the whole time, you're going to eventually get bored and quit. Whereas if you, like, it is much healthier for us for you to play for, like, say, a month um leave for two months come back for another league play for another right. month so on right like we would rather like we're fine with you quitting the game so long as you're planning to come back mm -hmm. yeah um take so, a break it's, yeah exactly it's totally so, so yeah absolutely so so like like our preferred player is you know yeah they play for a month they leave they come back and play for another month mm -hmm. again later and i think that um you know for sustainability wise that's much better um and also you know it gives you a chance to just re-energize and then come back mm. um you know and, and play the game see what's different right so i mean with our league structure leagues tend to go for three months yes usually. exactly exactly I mean, um, we've experimented with slightly longer slightly shorter and three yeah. ended up being the, the right place um it's interesting though that a lot of people uh we see this in the community especially three weeks into a league they'll be like now that the league's almost done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but once again um, I, I'm, I, I am okay with that i'm, I'm actually okay with, okay with that there is one uh hurdle there which is new players feel apprehensive about joining a league that is yeah. at even just a couple weeks old i understand i understand that and i mean like to be honest that ends up not being a huge amount because we get most of our new players around when we're doing yeah. new leagues anyway because that's when the publicity is happening i mean right now um you know like the obviously we're in the low cycle of a, of a of a league there's not that many people playing relative to the high point you know yeah and, and that and it changes like a huge amount you know like five times difference that kind of thing um mm. so i mean there's really not a lot of, like there's not a lot of virality going on so therefore there's not a lot of people you know like a lot of new players coming in yeah um, whenever we do announcements and so on then it starts to be a big deal so i mean we're in a, in a not very long now we have the beta mm -hmm. um that's going to bring a huge amount more players to the game you know there'll be fingers crossed you know, uh, well <laughs> I, I i think of all the launches we have done this is the one we feel the most confident about in mm. terms of like you know because normally it's like, okay, is there enough cool stuff in this expansion? Mm. And this one is like, yeah, there's enough cool stuff in this expansion. Yep. <laughs> Agreed. There's, there's plenty of cool stuff in this expansion. Um, so yeah, the the, uh, the 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 beta can be a bit rough sometimes as well, though, because then it's like, okay, so you've got this thing where it's like, um, there'll be people who like don't want to play because it's a beta, and mm -hmm. then you have to hope that those people then come back uh, when the beta is over. Mm -hmm. So there's always a little bit of you know roughness around there. But um, there's also the people who play the beta. And feel like there's no new content. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, launched. in this case, there will be. I mean, we've already announced the fact that um, that the the last two acts are not going to be yeah um, in the beta. Yeah, there there will be um, plenty of new stuff. Yeah, but there's still plenty of new stuff. I mean, you know, there's still way more content coming in this expansion than there ever has been before. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I think we got time for one more question, or or we, we can probably go as long as you. Oh, we can keep on going. I mean, yeah. I'm all right. Fine. We'll, yeah. we'll ask a couple more. This is this is kind of a long one. Um, it's in multiple parts. This is from Mortichar or. Maybe more to car? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've got some programming-specific questions for you. Now, this yeah. is interesting because we very rarely talk about programming because none of us three are programmers. Mm -hmm. um, however, we had programming guests on, and because we're all kind of – at least I, I speaking for myself, I'm dumb. So um, <laughs> I have trouble following programming speak at times. Uh, but let's talk about this for a little bit. So his questions are, I know the game is written almost entirely in C++. Mm -hmm. What popular third-party libraries do you guys use? Um, and he gives some examples. Uh, C, it says, C++ doesn't come with standard libraries for graphical and audio programming, so I mm -hmm. assume you guys use something. Yep. So, uh, obviously, DirectX is the big graphics API mm -hmm. um, that we use. We used to be exclusively DX9. Now we've got DX11. Um, over time, um, going forward, new graphical features will be DX11 only mm. um, because DX9, it's harder to implement that stuff in DX9. Um, and also, you know, like, I mean, 
most people at this point can run DX11. Um, so in fact, for 3.0, we're changing that to be the default um, new thing. Right. So I know uh, we're experimenting with some new features. Um, one that um, I know that, that people are interested in doing. So we've got this for the Xbox so far is dynamic resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some of our programmers internally are very keen to do this on PC as well. It's a bit harder to do on PC, but that'll be, a, once again, a DXL only feature. So the idea um, there... Uh, so the idea basically there is as the effects get more, um, as the effects start to build up, um, the resolution gets lowered. It's quite hard to notice that it's happening because generally speaking, um, when there's more effects on screen, there's also more movement and chaos. And so mm. you don't tend to notice the resolution going down a bit. Um, but basically, um, you can halve the resolution before people even really notice. Wow. Well. Um, uh, and that doubles your frame rate. Right. Um, so, yeah. So it uh, keeps it buttery smooth. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, 60 FPS is more important than um, resolution, generally. Um, but then on the stills, you really want to have the high resolution. Um, so, uh, you know, like, it's, 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 dynamic resolution is quite a cool thing. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, we've got it on Xbox going. Um, PC is harder because the um, on Xbox, you can just, like, at any time, you can be like, how much is the GPU being utilized? It's just there for you to to know right on uh, pc it's like um because the graphics card is separated um it take there's some lag time between when you can uh to find out how much the gpu was utilized mm. and so then you get this annoying thing where it's like okay it takes like 50 milliseconds of like of, of before you find out or whatever so then it's like okay we have to wait for the this to come back and that means you get like a few slow frames and then it speeds up again and yeah so it's kind of annoying that way but like i mean we think it still might be worthwhile but we're thinking of having this as an option um it's not guaranteed but it's just something that we've been talking about that's cool. Uh, and, you know, other, other such features like that might be um, DX11 only. Um, so mm. that's obviously one thing. Um, then there's, we use FMOD um, for audio. Yep. Um, we used to use OpenAL, but that was pretty much, everyone just gave up on that at some point, and so it wasn't supported anymore. Um, so we had to transition over to something else. And FMOD, that um, really helped with the audio. I think things 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 sound a lot cooler now. Yeah. Um, um, Andrew, Andrew, who's our sound guy, was very, very happy. FMOD is an Australian. It developed. is. Yes, it is. Uh, um, I, when I, I, before I worked, uh, at GGG, I worked on a really, really terrible mobile game. Oh yeah, and we used FMOD, um, so that was <laughs> uh, that was interesting. It's yeah. cool what FMOD can do. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's really nice. Andrew has got a lot more ability to um, sort of implement interesting things mm -hmm. than he had before. Like it used to require a lot more programmer time for him to do that stuff. Right. So um, you know, there's little subtle touches that he likes to do now, where it's like, did you realize that when you walk under the like canvas in Act One Town? You can hear the like rain on the canvas oh, when you walk wow. under it. When you walk out of it, you can't anymore. Like, little things like that. That he's cool. you know, little touches that he does um, that are quite cool. FMOD um, also has a lot of like dynamic audio adjusting to make things feel. Yeah, so I mean, random. there's little little things that like, for example, when you've got an explosion, he can like duck the rest of the audio. So like you've got an explosion, so you sort of like so you know the explosion kind of has some effect on like what your your ability to hear other stuff. Mm. And little mm -hmm. little details like that. So you know, there's lots of little interesting things. Yeah, that, that game is sounding amazing. Yeah, yeah. Good job, Andrew. Yep. And uh, we should get him on here. We've been trying to get him on. He's he's busy, man. He's, oh yeah. yeah. He's seriously he's the lot. busiest guy right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, it's 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 annoying though, actually, because um, like he vacillates between like extremely busy when things are about to come out to like don't doesn't have a huge amount to do right because there's um, no new sound coming exa in. exactly so um like i sort of said to him hey you know like do you want us to hire another sound guy and he's kind of like well the problem with that is that like then it would be even worse when there's like the low periods hmm. you know so like um yeah it's, it's sort of it's sort of, it's sort of tough um it would be really nice if we had some way to sort of stretch out like his work so that he can be working on sound earlier yeah but you really can't make sound until the visuals look mm. relatively complete like you just don't know what the hell it's supposed to sound like right um so yeah it's uh it's tough so what he ends up doing is sort of polishing the rest of the time mm. um which does help but you know it's kind of yeah, it's just unfortunate how that how that ends up being yeah um, i mean we also have like audio dialogue stuff that yeah. often comes in very late. Yes. Well, that's because we're making story changes right up to the last minute as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and it's real annoying. It's like sometimes there's conversations of like, you know, uh, can we make the story change? It's like, oh, have we done the voice actor? Has the voice yeah. actor come in yet? And like, you know, that's it's real harsh. Well, if we change this, that means these two quests have to change. That means oh, they, man. like a lot yeah. of this stuff. Well, I mean, like a random thing was like the, so we're removing the warehouses from part, um, from Act 3 in, um, oh, yeah. in, uh, in this that. version. And so then it's like, okay, but there's like a ton of random voice actors. Uh, like we were planning, we, we wished we could do that for ages, mm. but we couldn't do it because um, the voice acting um, of all the people in town um, would have to change. Right. Um, 
So when we're doing um, Act 8, um, we have to get the voice actors back in anyway. Yeah. So now that we're getting the voice actors back in, now suddenly we can make changes to Act 3 again. That's yeah. Cool. Um, so there's like little details Fix about this. lots of little things. Um, yeah. And just before anyone gets the hopes up too high, um, the warehouses is actually turning into an Act 8 area. Yeah. Uh, so we're still using it. It's I just, think it's uh, being renamed it though. Uh, yeah, it has been renamed. But yeah. th- that tile set is being reused. I yep. think that, I think, I, I also believe that some of the things people don't like about it have been fixed in the Act 8 mm-hmm. version. Um, so. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, we've, we've but I mean, uh, Act 3 was a bit long. Um, so we wanted to, to, to streamline it a bit. And also people were getting real confused with the way the sewers worked and everything like that. So sewers are, are a bit confusing. Yeah. 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 So basically we, th- that refactor just makes, uh, just fixes that up a little bit and that's a bit, bit Very easier. Cool. So there's more to this question, by the way. Yes. What other languages do you use? Do you guys have a scripting language for developers that don't do engine work similar to how unity uses C sharp for scripting? Um, technically we do, but I, it's not really, we have a thing called Geel. Yes. Right? We do have a thing called Geel, which. It's more just like the ability to trigger predefined things on predefined set of events. Like you can kind of do some complicated stuff with it. Like, I mean, obviously, honestly, you'd be better to answer this question. In I've some only ways. done a little bit. Ryan, who we had on uh, to a, a couple episodes ago, uh, has been getting very, very deep into Geel. Right. Uh, things that we normally do with uh, rule sets, like boss fights. Right, right. You he's doing do it, almost yeah. entirely in Geel. Yeah, now. you can do that. You, you can do that. It's... um. I mean, that's what a rule sets came after Geo, in fact. Um, mm. So, like, I mean, that, that originally we were intended to use Geo for that stuff, but um, it just kind of got a bit. Um, sometimes it's just sometimes the thing. The thing with um, the the Geo is it's very object focused. So it's like this object is going to do this thing to some other thing, and sometimes you need a higher level view. Yeah, and that's what rule sets are for. So that's like a thing where, um, you know, you. Uh, uh, it's it, it like something like uh, what's an example? Like a lot of boss fights use rule sets um, these days. Um, because uh, they, I think uh, a good example is probably the Rigwald fight. I think the rule set yeah, there's a lot determined of stuff, what daemons appeared. Yeah, where. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the in, like at a higher level in the Rigwald mm. fight. So you need something. Um, you need, you need to have some like higher level thing that can manage the fight as a whole. Right. Um. So yeah, that's kind of like a you know a, a manager that can just you know like do things at any time and mm-hmm. like know what all the objects are. Whereas Jill um code is more like um you know oh I just played this animation so therefore I'm going to find this object and do that to it. Or whatever, you know, it's kind of more like, you know, an event driven thing. Right. Um, yeah. Um, um, but interestingly, I think he, at least Ryan said this, the fact that it's all object oriented means that uh, you have fewer weird cases where things that are meant to happen don't and you get into a bad state. Right, right. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's certainly, I mean, look, both, both are tools that are useful for different situations. Mm. Um, the other thing with GL is that it's, um, it, it adapts quite well to like, you know, um, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> like it, it adapts quite well to um, like different situations because you can refer to like, you know, just I find a thing that has this property nearby and do it. And then so it works in different areas and, you know, stuff right. like that sometimes if you if you if you're if you're doing it well anyway. Um, so, yeah, that, that can be useful. But um, honestly, I don't even really program much gameplay anymore. So um, you're you doing know, much like, broader system stuff. Uh, well, I mean, honestly, I get saddled a lot with the back end mm. um, these days. Um, so uh, that's kind of where I'm working. But uh, and honestly, the gameplay department is pretty much run by uh, Mark One now. Yeah. Um. So I, when I do my rounds at this point, um, and talk to all the programmers, I pretty much don't talk to the gameplay programmers because that's all handled by Mark. Um. And you know, honest, and honestly, like the the designers are giving the those gameplay programmers work, and Mark is managing them. So I kind of don't need to do that anymore. Um. Instead, I'm more dealing with um. So so a big part of um what I'm doing at the moment is like console stuff. Right. Um, like at least in terms of like, you know, and that, that ties in a lot to performance because like, almost like probably like 90% of the work for console was like performance stuff. Yeah. They ended up um, making the PC version. Yeah. Maybe not 90%, maybe like, you know, 70%, sure. something like that. Um, cause I mean, obviously there's a lot of UI work to do as well, but, yeah. um, you know, it was just a, a huge amount of it was just, you know, making the DX 11 client. So, yeah. Um, uh, this isn't part of that question, but do you have like a, a preference on what you work on? Um, are are there things that you find particularly enjoyable? I prefer programming to managing. (laughs) Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, honestly, like a huge amount of my day at this point is just event driven. So people come to me and ask me stuff. Much like (laughs) you. Yeah. 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 Um, so like, I mean, I don't love that, but you have to do it. 
yeah like you know um probably the biggest thing that's the most important function i have right now is knowing how everything works yep and knowing what everyone is working on um so that like when someone comes to me with a question i know who to tell them to, to go talk to mm. and um or like or i don't even have to tell them to bother someone else because i happen to know how these things work um so that's that's important um i do prefer it when i actually get to to code which i still do every day like, i'm mm. still work, i'm still coding every day like i mean um you know i wrote the new microtransaction stuff i didn't do the ui i did all the back end and everything for it um so that's like the you know the most recent thing um uh Probably the thing that I like working on the most is graphics, but I haven't worked on that for a long time now. Right. Um, I don't really get to do that anymore. Um, and I actually surprisingly enjoy databases for some reason. <laughs> um, like, yeah, I don't know why. But uh, <laughs> the things that uh, that annoy me to work on are when you've got some really annoying structural issue where it's like, we did it this way in the past and now that means I can't do this thing and right. then having to deal with that and like find some way to get around it. That's the stuff that really annoys me the most. Just um, cause it's not really bad decisions or whatever. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it, they're not bad decisions. They're just not knowing about the future. Mm. Right. Like mm. it was a perfectly good decision when it was made. It's just that now the situation has changed mm. and we want to do this other thing. Um, so, you know, that's, 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 that's where things get annoying. Um, when you're working on something that's fresh and new, that's like completely, you know, new, then then you don't have that anymore, and it's much right. more fun to work <laughs> on. So uh, yeah. Um, so to continue, more to char, more to car is question: Does POE use an ECS? An which ECS in, in, in brackets entity component system. Oh, we do. Yes, we do. What does that mean? Uh, so basically, the idea there is that um, this is probably getting so. There's a couple. <laughs> of, there's, there's probably there's, there's, so there's two sort of. Um, common ways to represent game objects um where these days everything uses components and but in the past people used to um use inheritance uh to represent game things so basically okay. you'd have like okay a you'd have like a, an object and then you've got like a movable object and then that wouldn't you know be like a you know pathfinding object maybe and then that might go to like monster and then you've got individual type of monster and there'd be like inheritance all the way down right um which i think is used in, at least in parts uh so we have the concept of inheritance sort of so. but i it's not like how you're thinking okay um, i'm talking like you know that so inheritance is like a thing where um uh you know it is like a in a, a, what they call an is a relationship so a you know a uh but this boss is a type of monster and a monster is a type of move, a pathfinding entity and a pathfinding entity is a type of moving. This is the right. type of thing you would have, right? Okay. I mean, they, they, get, they, they tend to get really complicated though because um, you start to get questions of like, okay, what's a good example of this? Like a door is a like entity that has a location, but it also is like a thing that does something. Uh, oh no, okay, this is not a good example. I need to find... So, so you, you get situations where like um, you're trying to do this sort of uh, inheritance thing mm -hmm. But then you end up with two entities that are both kind of similar, right? But they can't share the same base uh, type for some reason. Uh, maybe like totems and traps or something like that. Uh, no? Sort of, maybe. But I, I'm I'm struggling to think of a good example. But anyway, mm. the uh, it, it's like okay, um, like let's say you've got like some thing that's like an interactable object, right? And all your interactable objects don't move, so therefore they're, they're entities that have position, but they don't have pathfinding as part of them. Right. So therefore, but then suddenly you want a thing you can interact with that moves around. So then suddenly it's like, okay, well, do I base this off the um, the pathfinding thing and then duplicate all the interaction code, or do I base it off the interaction thing and then duplicate all the pathfinding code? Right. So anyway, this is the problem that you get with inheritance systems like that. And um, uh, components are basically the idea that um, you've got a, a that a an object is a grab bag of um, components right um so i mean you'll have seen these nick because um the when you're making an ot file yes you've got all the different components yep. in there and then you set them up so that means if you want to make something interactable you add the interactable component and it doesn't matter if it's like a monster or a whatever like anything could be interactable all it needs is the interactable component to be gotcha. added to it and then and then it works it so is. basically like so when you're adding new behaviors to things you add components to them um and that's how you make an entity and yeah we do use a components S like sort of like building a computer from a kit or something you, you're not making the chips and then uh, you've, you've got a graphics card you've got a motherboard of, and they'll plug together kind of i no? suppose but you know <laughs> uh anyway uh, it, it, the, uh, the i remember our um component system actually was based off an article i read about dungeon siege 
mm. um, a long time ago about how they did it, and I based my implementation off of that. So, um, yeah, we do use that, um, a component system like cool. that. Uh, he's um, got one last little question. Yeah. Do you guys hire non-Kiwis? We do, but we tend to only do that if um, they have experience um, in, you know, like that we want to hire for. Right. Uh, and that's sort of a bit of a requirement even for immigration. Yeah. Um, if you want to get someone a work visa, you have to prove that you couldn't hire a Kiwi for the same role. Um, so that means, you know, uh, generally speaking, we wouldn't hire a junior programmer from overseas. We hire juniors locally. Mm. Um, and then seniors will get from overseas. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. We've got, let's, let's do one more question. Um, <laughs> this is from Hold Ma Dick. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I quite I quite like this question. Uh, off top, uh, this is not related to Pee-wee. Uh From your point of view, what do you think that the will be the next big breakthrough in games? Not hardware, but more like the first MMO or the first large open world game, etc. What do you think the next big, uh, say, genre defining breakthrough will be? That's a really tough question. Mm. I mean, if I knew that, then I might be making that game. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well. But, uh, I mean, I, to me, Minecraft is probably the most recent one I can yeah, think of. Yeah, but could you have predicted it? Oh, oh absolutely not. But yeah. but when Minecraft came out, um, I could like Minecraft existed for a while. It was becoming yeah. big. I wouldn't have known that it was going to become a huge. Phenomenon. Right, I see what you mean. Um, well, it's tough. I mean, I, like I feel like I'm um, even. So I mean, a current thing that's big is like survival games, but that's kind of already right. past its prime mm. now. Like we're mm. kind of already past the point where that became like a huge thing. I'm trying to think like what's the you know like what is what is the thing that I'm seeing upcoming and I I honestly don't know. Mobas were an awesome. Uh, were, yeah, Mobas were a huge thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Hero shooters are kind of popping up, aren't they? Uh, it's interesting. Well, there was they they came up a while ago. Oh no, I suppose no. Okay, hero shooters as opposed to like what? team based like class shooters. You're right. As in, I mean, like, they're kind Overwatch of they're kind of an evolve, Yeah, they're they're yeah. evolving. They're just evolving the the class shooter yeah. into yeah. a different thing. It's you know. um and it's actually much closer to like a MOBA than it is mm. to like a, your traditional yeah, yeah, Doom I style. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess, but I, it's, it's honestly very hard to identify these trends. Mm. Yeah. Like, I, we, I don't think about it sometimes of like, what's the next, you know, like what, what's the next big thing in terms of like people creating, you know, a new type of gameplay. It's really hard mm. to, it's really, it's, it's honestly hard to say. Um, like, I was I, actually thinking about this uh, yesterday. Gen new genres pop up all the time without us even really realizing. Yeah. It. Yeah. Um, Idle games are, are a recent <laughs> one. Like that's yeah. a huge genre that yeah. didn't exist five years ago, basically. Yeah, it's true. Um, and so I, it's interesting. I was thinking, oh, we've probably come up with all of the game genres, but no, there's <laughs> tons. There's tons that just keep yeah. crop, cropping up. But then I mean, okay. But then the question is like, um, stuff something like Dota is that a genre? Uh, I mean, MOBAs are, yeah. Yeah, I sure. mean, I guess I guess it is. Yeah. But then at the same time, it's like it. You could still put it in one of the other earlier genres, right? Like, yeah, it's it's, it's become a subgenre, yes. but you know what I'm saying is like, there might not be any new high level genres if you know what I mean, right? Because everything, well, you know, I, it's I I I think that game development um doesn't evolve. The, it's not like someone comes comes up with a new archetype. Yeah. It seems to me be more like well, people don't really recognize things where, at the point where they come out as the thing that was really important. If you know what I mean, right? Like, well, I think on top of that, uh, it's more like evolution in which yeah, there yeah. are certain aspects are carried across yeah and then new aspects are focused on and branched out from there as, yeah, as yeah. well so it's it's just uh the emphasis shifts from game to game and yeah, yeah. ultimately a, a, a new genre is formed because yeah. it just becomes so distinct yeah yeah um but no i honestly don't have a good answer for this question like mm. uh, i can't i don't know the way the wind is blowing honestly like um I think when you're designing something it's easier to look back and say like what's the thing mm. that hasn't been done for a while right and say like okay what could we do what's the modern what what now that we have the now that we can do the things we can do what could we do with like this old type of gameplay that hasn't been used in a while yeah and i think that's honestly an i, I think that's an easier thing to come up with in some ways mm. um you know in terms of coming you know than you know but um this is a, kind of a bit unrelated but it was reminded me of it i found it very interesting the way that all the biggest games today were actually made 10 years ago <laughs> like look at the top list of like one of the most popular games you've got like counter-strike yeah you've got dota yeah league of legends you've got Le well, league well i mean okay but i would say league of legends is is, is just is, is dota right yeah like, yeah so what much. i mean is like like 
in some ways it's like is dota like you know like american football <laughs> mm. you know what i mean where it's like it's like you've got this timeless game that just kind of keeps going like, yeah like rule right. changes are made but like what i'm saying is like i almost wonder like pe- people kind of i think people thought games were different that like games come and go but I actually looking at it recently as you start to realize that like all the biggest things seem mm. to be timeless yeah certain archetypes are forming yeah. that are carrying through a, a totally um ignoring the normal generation cycle right exactly games. exactly um I remember when StarCraft II was being was in development. Uh, Blizzard's analogy was, "How do you uh, make a sequel to basketball?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, which uh, it's true. Like you, yeah. when you you create a system with uh, strong rules and strong interactions, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, you don't want to fiddle with it too much, right? And you want to let it grow naturally. One one thing I found interesting was Dean Hall's talk at last year's NZGDC. Dean Hall is the developer of, of Daisy. Yeah. Um, and how he was saying, you know, he, the survival genre mm-hmm. came up, um, and he was like, you know, I was just creating these games that I used to play back yeah. in my day. And yeah, yeah. I was like, holy shit, like this is, this is just the thing he had. You know? Yeah. And he was inspired to make and got a chance to make it, mm. you know, which, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people, especially a lot of game fans think about their ideal game a lot. Mm. Uh, it's just. The amount of work that goes into a game, especially what a, a typical person's ideal game would be, is so monumental that, that and, and requires so much organization and money that mm. it's infeasible for most people. Mm-hmm. Tell so. you what, I'd, I'd like to see a uh, open world someone. <laughs> really? You like open world games? I, I this think... is news to me. <laughs> With cars, Have you heard maybe? Of... <laughs> maybe? Possibly. Whoa. Yes, cars. M- maybe planes? Oh, you mean the Pixar? Yeah, Pixar's Planes <laughs> oh, movie. You want Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> well, technically, Pixar I cars. Was, that was Disney. Mm. You want Cars two? No, I've, I've seen Cars two. Okay, <laughs> Cars three. Is there a Cars three? <laughs> there, there, there was a trailer for no it idea. recently. Oh, really? Oh. oh, okay. But here's the weird thing, right? Like the trailer for it is like super dark. Oh. <laughs> like what? It was, like like it was like super serious and dark. Oh, like seriously, I, I'm gonna show you this trailer after this oh, podcast. Man. Okay, because <laughs> it's like seriously, it like it's it's so tonally a right turn that like I honestly was. <laughs> I've seen it and it's so okay. great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Hang on. To be fair, it's like Disney Pixar, and then it's like, <laughs> but it's like the super like it's like it's like, it's, it's like this trailer is like for like imagine this like hard boiled like Indy 500 like you know like th- these are like the trials and tribulations oh, of, like you know, you know it's like there's like a heartbeat like yeah yeah no seriously there's like a heartbeat through the whole trailer <laughs> of, you know it's like yeah, well, yeah. what's making the heartbeat there's their cars like <laughs> maybe there's a car with a human heart buried oh inside God. of it that's what makes it dark there was a straight up murder yeah. um <laughs> man is there any I mean, to be fair sorry just to, just, I okay um Toy Story 3 had a moment where all of the toys accepted their own death. Yeah, so that was that, that was, was pretty great. dark. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jonathan, is there anything new happening in the programming space? I mean, I know this is a that's loaded pretty question. generic <laughs> question. Um, I would say, um, in game development, like there seems to be this real split happening between the like people using engines and people not mm. more. Like mm. it sort of seems almost in this case that people look down on you for not using. Unity or Unreal? Wow. Um, huh. Like, there's a real kind of like you know, I don't know, and I sort of see that. Um, there's so much pride in your own engine, though. Don't, um, don't you get that? I, I don't think it's a pride thing. I think people just overestimate the amount of work. Like, okay, for for a game, as games get, um, for certain types of games, it really makes sense to use your own engine. Mm. But I think that um, for a lot of smaller games like it's really not that much work to write your own and it kind of makes it like i mean okay i think part of the problem is the fact that people consider like i'm going to write an engine to be even a thing at all like like we didn't write an engine for poe we just wrote poe right you hmm. know what i mean like poe doesn't really have an engine hmm. it's just it's just a game yeah you started you know I mean? off very small and, and yeah yeah so like like, like when you think about it when you're thinking about it in terms of writing a game rather than writing an engine i think that like it gets a lot simpler because i'm not like writing this whole like giant thing i'm just writing you know, I'm just I'm just making the stuff that Poe needs, mm. right? You're you know not I mean? picturing the the path of exile at launch. You're right. picturing uh, I want a box that and can so kill another we just, box. We just <laughs> add, we just add the stuff that it needs as we need it, and yeah. and obviously at this point now that effectively means we've got this pretty complicated engine. But like you know, it didn't and like people when you're writing a small game, I think it's actually nicer to not have 
all the complication that an engine has. Mm. Like sometimes you just want to like just you know like it, there's a certain there's a certain power that comes from understanding the entire code base and like you know there's there's nothing that anyone else has done that gets in my way here, right? right. Like every bug I have is my bug and I can solve it because I know all the code mm. and all that sort of stuff like that, right? And so I think a lot of people would be served when they're making when you're making a really small game. I think it would be better served by that than actually using, mm. you know, Unity or Unreal where like you've got this giant complicated thing. Now, on the other hand, when you're using Unreal, it's like you've got this crazy like lighting system and everything and everything's really cool, but mm. not every game needs that. Mm. Um, and also to use that stuff, you need to make art that is like justifying all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So like the level of art required to make like a really awesome looking un mm. you know, real Unreal Engine game is like obviously really high. Mm -hmm. So like I think sometimes that you'd be better off picking you know, just a simple art style and then a simple engine, therefore. Right. Um, but then on the other hand, like if you want to hire other people, then having people who know those tools that the industry standard is really good too. That's true. Um, so, yeah. You know, that's, that's really important. And so th there's certainly something to be said for that, but you know, I don't regret writing an engine. Um, not that I feel that I did anyway, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I don't regret writing our own renderer and everything like that. that mm -hmm. That's fine. And um, you know, it's, 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 it's cool now, you know, like with, we can do, we can do some pretty cool stuff. So it's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's let's wrap it up. Uh, if you've got questions, we'll have Jonathan on in the future, I'm sure. Um, love having you here. Uh, you can email your questions to frontseatquestions at gmail.com. You can also tweet at frontseatcast. We've got a Facebook page, facebook.com slash frontseatcast. Uh, our WordPress site is frontseatgamer.wordpress.com, and our YouTube channel now officially has a URL because we hit more than 100 subscribers, youtube.com slash frontseatcast. Uh, you should rate us on iTunes and tell your friends. Uh, thank you so much for coming in, Jonathan. Cheers, man. Uh, it's been great. Always man. fun having you in. So, you're you're new the host. You're the new ho host. So, <laughs> um, I quit. Jonathan's now hosting. Confirmed. Uh, well, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, probably. Yep. Awesome. Uh, and we'll see you then. See you. Bye. Bye. Now we can have YouTube slash front seat cast. Oh, I see. Yeah. Not front seat gamer. There's already a front seat gamer. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, That's why we're front seat cast in the in the first place. Yeah. We're I, front seat cast on almost everything. Yeah. Except why can't we just keep it consistent? We've got front seat questions at gmail.com, front seat at front seat cast on Twitter, Facebook.com slash front seat cast, front seat gamer dot wordpress dot com, yep. and then YouTube is front seat cast. Yeah. It's just we gotta We've got three. I don't know. I mean, here. I, I, who would have thought that like front seat gamer was a popular name that has already been taken? It really doesn't make any sense. No, does it? it doesn't. <laughs> All right, let's get started.